So uh, do you know if Teddy made it to five movies for the year? Because he's been ghosting me. Oh, no, absolutely not. Why he wanted to get his top five? He texted me like a week and a half ago, said he was watching The Meg 2. And I oh, thought, oh, okay, there you that go. That definitely makes his list. That, Reacher, and like Paw Patrol 2. I don't even know if he's seen Paw Patrol. That's, he's not even a good father. <laughs> Damn. That is crazy. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Soup Show, the Nerd Soup YouTube channel, not the Nerd Soup Podcast, but I guess essentially it is the Nerd Soup Podcast. I am Bo Oliver here with Aaron, the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to count down our best movies of the year for the year 2023. It's a yearly tradition over here at Nerd Soup. Uh, I think some years we've done top 10, some years we've done top 15, but there are a lot of movies, I think, to talk about. So we uh, decided to extend it to top 20. I think we did top 20 last year as well. And uh, I'm excited. A lot of good movies came out this year. Some uh, good miniseries as well. This should be a fun video. And we took questions. We got some good year-end questions about this year and uh, movies and shows. Movies that uh, exceeded our expectations. Some movies that disappointed us. What were some of the best performances? So we have a lot of fun things to get into. And of course, you can follow us on social medias all across the board. At NerdSoup, at BoSoup, at NerdSoupMonkey. And like, share, subscribe on YouTube because that's something that helps the YouTube and yeah. um, floss. Make sure you floss, especially at night. Dude, I don't floss. It's not good. Obviously, you want to floss twice a day, but uh, definitely at night. You want to clear out the teeth, let the gums rest. It's I was getting to like where I do it for like two days and then I never touch it again. Very important for your gum health. Eh, Keep those gums healthy. It's propaganda. Yeah, no, it is propaganda. They need to sell floss picks, but the floss picks are so much better than the regular floss. Mm. Game changer. More efficient. Uh, they have a minty scent. Uh, seriously, we're not even sponsored. I don't even know the brand. <laughs> I just I just love the floss picks. Good after a meal. You know, like when your your dad or your uncle would get the pick, have yeah. the pick hanging out of his mouth? Mm -hmm. The aesthetic of the floss pick doesn't really, you know, you can't really have it hanging out of your mouth, but it's more efficient. Utilitarian. Yeah. It's like, you know how some people like leave the pick in their hair? Yeah, no, you can't really <laughs> do, can't that with, the pick in. do that with a floss pick. It could work. You could be a trendsetter. Right. I feel like that's a big thing with propaganda is just making it look cool. If you can make something look cool, more more people will do it. Cigarettes. Oh, yeah. It's a, you know what? It's a, it's a shame they're not allowed to advertise anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of which, I stopped smoking and I haven't pooped in like five days. So. I think I might have to start smoking again. Is that something that happens? I guess. I'm well, they say up. correlation equals causation. You need the smoke to break down the food. Die an early painful death or have regular bowel movements. <laughs> it's closer than you think. No, it's not fun when you're getting older and you have to make those choices. I threw my back out like last week and I've just been in shambles. It's just, uh, what, what were you doing? I was squatting, which is another thing. Like, why am I squatting? I just got to give up. I'm getting, I'm getting 30 years old, man. It's time to wrap it up. Were you trying to impress somebody? Are you going blow for blow with somebody at the gym? You have one of those rivalries? No. The unspoken it was, rivalry? It was literally just a warm up, like the lightest weight possible. <laughs> I just went down and I just couldn't get back up. It was so embarrassing. I just fell. And I just laid on the ground for like five minutes. Just a fucking victim <laughs> of science. His gravity yeah. said, nope, sorry. Fucking Newton, man. My life would be so much easier without him. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. I'll start it. I'll, I'll start with um, my twenty two sixteen movies, and we'll get we'll just get into it. So number twenty for me was a movie that recently came out on Netflix, and that is May December, a movie Ooh. that I watched at the New York Film Festival. Enjoyed it. Uh, I didn't even have it in my top twenty after watching it the first time, but it was the second time where I really started to appreciate it, and I thought the dual performances of Natalie Portman and Julianne Moore were fantastic. And a movie that shows that actors are evil, disgusting predators. That's why it's uh, not getting any nominations. Yeah, no, uh, everybody likes the uh, euphoria meme. Holy shit, is this about us? Yeah, I've had a 19. Um, Natalie Portman, man. We're, did we talk about her before or after this? we saw this movie on a previous podcast? Uh, I can't remember, but we definitely talked about her. Yeah. Um, I mean, that monologue that when she's doing her audition or whatever it was, was fucking fantastic. And Julianne Moore, like you said, both of their performances 
absolutely crazy. And then you have Melton, who probably might win Best Supporting Actor, probably one of the more well-acted movies of the year. And it, it's fun to see him, seeing where he uh, started from, you know, a lot of fans of, uh, it was Riverdale, right? That was the show he comes from. Mm-hmm. And he said that he was his Juilliard. So a lot of fans of Riverdale are, are having fun with this newfound uh, stardom. Because it it is a transition, you know, when you're on a show that's mostly for teens and then you give a performance that's, uh, you know, you're going toe to toe with Natalie Portman. That's very impressive. So it's been an awesome year for him. Dude, it's so funny because like it's always interesting to see what people gravitate to when, when it comes to like looks, because obviously him on the red carpet, everyone's just like fawning over him. And it's him and Dominic Sessa from uh, Holdovers <laughs> that I've been seeing a lot. And like they're both like very good looking guys, but like just the just the stark differences and like this one guy who's just classically like just very good looking and this other guy who's like kind of this weird nerdy type that it's just such a wide range. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Dude from the holdovers looks like a teenager from the seventies. That was great <laughs> casting. Exactly. Um but yeah, I, yeah, I have that at 19. So one of the better movies of the year. And we were talking before we started recording, just I think my top 20 is pretty fucking stacked, probably more so than it would be any time I can remember, at least. Because usually when you're making these longer lists, like by the time you get to like 15 through 20, you're, lo- you're like kind of like, eh, I don't know, maybe I'll just throw this one in there. This one was actually pretty tough. I think in a normal year, May, December is probably like top 15, maybe close to top 10. I don't know, because I feel like every year I have a bunch of movies that uh, I feel terrible leaving them out of my top 20. Every year, people say it's been a weak year for movies. Uh, I saw somebody on Letterbox. It's like, man, this year has really sucked. And then I looked at their, I don't know who, I can't remember who it was. So sorry think, for taking shots at you. I saw and that too. They had and watched it was like 23 take. movies. <laughs> yeah. It was an awful take. <laughs> Which I think sometimes people look at what movies are going to be nominated for awards and the blockbusters, and that's how they judge it. So there were a lot of good awards contenders this year that people feel are worthy and also good blockbusters. So I think that makes people think that, uh, or feel that it was a, just a healthier year. But uh, May, December, like I said, I've shuffled this list so many times. This was a last minute i need to acknowledge this movie as one of the best and uh number 19 on my list was a movie called a fire this is from christian petzold a uh, german director this was really good uh something that is uh currently streaming on movie it caught my attention because it was appearing on some other best lists so i thought i'd check it out and it's a uh, you know your typical genius tortured artist who's uh, on a getaway and can't enjoy the fun, can't enjoy anything outside of his artistic window. And there's some creative and clever subversions of, of some of those tropes of the femme fatale. Um, Paula Beer gave one of the best performances, in my opinion, of the year. So that's a, a movie I would definitely recommend people checking out. Like I said, it's uh, streaming on movie. And it's, uh, yeah, the title, it's literally about people at a getaway and there's a forest fire. So I like that. Double meaning. Like when titles are just spot on. Yeah, there's nothing like a good title. My favorite title for anything will always be Minecraft. I've said this before, but it's just so simple. You mine and you craft. <laughs> I like Mission Impossible. It's just yeah, <laughs> these missions be impossible sometimes. He pulls it off. What a fucking guy! Another good movie that uh, I think is uh, I don't even know where it is on this list. But number eighteen, uh, Passive Fiction. So this was a movie by Albert Serra starring Benoit Magamel, who is, uh, also gives a great performance in another movie on my top 20 list. This one's a bit more down the line, but uh, I loved this movie. It's literally about a guy. It's like three hours long, and it's a guy in Tahiti just walking around and doing politics with the locals representing the French government. It's very minimal on plot, but maximal on vibes. Mm. And uh, somebody described it as, you know, geopolitics is sort of like being in a, in a nightclub when you have the neon lights and everybody rubbing shoulders and, and there's agendas and, and secrecy everywhere. And that's kind of what the movie was. It was just packed out with vibes. It's literally this one guy walking around the island uh, talking to people. And he's, he's just incredibly charismatic. And I'll, I'll talk about him a bit down the road in this episode because he, like I said, he stars in another one of my favorite movies of the year. Uh, I would say, you know, if you don't like movies where people are walking around and talking for three hours, don't watch this. I always love when an uh, actor, they should have like a, an accumulation award. Oh, like, like San- best performances. Like, like Sandra Holler being in Anatomy of a Fall and Zone of Interest. Great performances in one year. Like yeah, you she win, should be able to uh, leverage that. You win something. best actor for being in two great movies and giving two great performances. The most actor. 
Yeah, the Golden Globes <laughs> are just making shit up, so <laughs> might as well just. I saw a fake category. It was like um, most preparation put into a role, and Bradley Cooper was advocating for it. Well, Mia Goff might win that one now. That story, I mean, that's a whole different story, but it, it was kind of upsetting to see all the jokes about it. You know, everybody yeah. loves the working class until it's Mia Goff kicking somebody in the head and scolding them. It's just so weird. It's such a played out way for actors and actresses to to act on set. I remember when we talked with Eric Nolan, his time on Game of Thrones, and he talked about there were no divas because there was just no time for it. And everybody was very professional. So uh, obviously those types of horror stories become legend. Um uh, Usually when the actors or the directors are no longer here. Right. But yeah, that's a weird story. I mean, people just can't act professionally. Like, <laughs> I'm a genius actor. Uh, number 17, uh, from my boy Ryusuke Hamaguchi, who directed one of my favorite movies of all time a few years ago, Drive My Car. This is Evil Does Not Exist. It's a much smaller, more intimate movie. Actually, Drive My Car was pretty intimate, but this one was intimate as well. And uh, it's a story. Many people have said that it's a you know it's about the importance of taking care of the environment, and uh, the way that local governments try to encroach on the environment, uh, trying to build things, trying to monetize it, uh, essentially trying to destroy it. But I also think there's a point to be made in this movie about how being too in touch with nature can leave you out of touch with the other things in your life, like family, friends, obligations. And uh, as I said, it's it's not quite as epic, not quite as masterful as Drive My Car, but it does feature people talking in cars and smoking cigarettes mm-hmm. and uh, wood uh, chopping. I thought, wood chopping. Yeah, actually, that was one of the more satisfying scenes of the year. Yeah. It made me really want to chop some wood. There's a technique to it, you know? Yeah. I thought like just outside and probably like, an honorable mention. It looked great. Um, and that like public forum scene is fucking hilarious. Oh, yeah. One of the funniest scenes of the year, dude. It, it, <laughs> it reminded me of Parks and Rec. Uh, and number 16, rounding out my first five, uh, my dear Hirokazu Korita, one of my favorite directors working today, the master of sentimentality. Once again, uh, another very touching and emotional movie called Monster. And mm. some people say that he is a bit too sentimental, but for me, it always works. He always leaves me in tears. Uh, multiple times throughout the movie because uh, the way that he tackles family relationships and uh, the hardships that families have to go through to maintain those relationships is uh, he's just second to none when it comes to to that type of material. It was another great movie by Corita, who he's just so prolific. It seems like he pumps out a movie every fucking year and it always ends up on my list. Yeah, I haven't I didn't see that one yet. And disclaimer for like my list, like I haven't seen every movie. And so if it's not on there, I either didn't see it or I just don't think it's in my top 20. So there's that. But number 20, this one, like I kind of, it's right there. It was either going to be 20 or like just outside, but I figured I would add it in just to talk about it a little and it's Saltburn because I know so many people don't like this movie at all. And I know you're not a huge fan of it, but I I just was thoroughly entertained throughout. I, I don't like it for like, some of the reasons like you see like some people or people get made fun of being like, oh, it's so disturbing and creepy. And it really isn't. There's some moments in it, but I think it's just a. Uh, it's not every day you see stuff. It's like, like I, have fr- I have friends who don't really see that many movies who've seen this movie. Like, yo, that movie was so fucked up and everything. Right. And there and are like, moments that are really disgusting. Sure. <laughs> no, no, oh, for sure. Um, but like. For entertainment value and like just me being on board for what was it two and a half hours, I actually like just enjoyed it for um, seeing where it was going to go. I have problems with it certainly, especially the ending. But um, like when you talked about like before in a different way, like vibes movie, I kind of just dug the vibe of it and was just having a good time watching it. Rosamund Pike, I, I think, was the best performance in that movie. So funny. Every line of dialogue she spoke. I, I recently rewatched it, and uh, I was like, this is maybe the funniest character ever. <laughs> well, her and Richard E. Grant were fucking the best. Yeah. And he's great. I thought it was like, I was just generally like, I thought it was generally funny too at times. And especially from those two characters and their, their outlook on things and how they deal with situations. And just Barry Keoghan being just a little freak. How can you not love it? He is a freak and he is little. He is so little compared to Jacob Araldi. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You can literally just put him in his pocket and carry him around. Perfect uh, one-two punch there between the 
between them. Great chemistry. And then 19, I had May, December. We already talked about it. But um, yeah, I think that uh, did um, SAG came out with their nominations already, right? Uh, I think so. I think it was shut out. Even Ensemble? Uh, I'm, I'm not weird. sure. That's ridiculous, man. Well, the fun debate about this movie was whether it was uh, funny or not, whether it was, mm. um, w- what's the word that they were using? Oh, camp. Because I saw this the first time in a packed crowd, and uh, you would have thought we were watching you know, Richard Pryor do stand-up from the, from the get-go. And I'm at, there were a lot of people in the audience who were um, way more familiar with uh, the story. Isn't it, yeah. yeah, yeah it's, I don't think it was necessarily camp. I think it was... I think there are definitely moments like that. And I do enjoy movies where at first, like, you are laughing at things, but then you slowly realize, like, oh, I probably, like, it It doesn't change, but, like, the more you re- know and the more you realize, it kind of plays a trick on you where you look back and it's like, ooh, maybe I shouldn't have been, like, laughing at some of those things because of the information I just learned about this character and what he's been through and, like, the the situation at, at a whole. Oh yeah, there were there were moments where uh, you know Natalie Portman is supposed to be the butt of the jokes, so I think that's what makes it almost not not appropriate to laugh. But she's just such a creep, and the things that she's saying, the things that she that she's doing. Yeah, uh, a lot of like, people came away with thing, uh, you know being more disgusted by her than Julianne Moore's character by the end of it. Right, like when she's like looking at the who's going to play the the child, and she's like, "Well, that's he's not sexy enough," or something like that. It's like, yeah, yeah. You see how problematic a, it is when Hollywood dissects these stories. They just right, but it's <laughs> such a ridiculously such a like overly gross thing to say that it does come off as like you do kind of have that cognitive dissonance where you do let out like a little chuckle, but then you like reflect on it, and a second later, it's like, oh, that's kind of fucked up. Yeah, there were a lot of moments like that in this movie. It's just the character wanting to believe, wanting to go even further than the truth, wanting to believe some of these unsettling backstories. Um, and uh, like I said, she just proved to be a predator herself. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes her performance so funny. <laughs> Probably the best she's ever been. And at 18, I have uh, Dumb Money. Did you, you saw that, right? Yes. I just uh, talk about like just enjoying movies. Like I just had a great time with this one. Interesting story because like that was just for me, it was just like a meme on the internet for like a couple of weeks. But like when I think they did a good job of really dissecting it and like showing everything that went into it. And it was just such an online movie. Like one of the only movies that I think actually have gotten online culture, like in this real time where like it's still kind of relevant and still applies to a lot today. Like the way they were able to use like TikToks and YouTube and Twitter to kind of help tell this story. I thought that was actually a nice little wrinkle to it and probably one of the better comedies of the year. Yeah, I I love Paul Dano. I'm a president of the Paul Dano fan club. Uh, Oh, you you got promoted. Was I vice president? Oh, you worked your way up. I don't remember. Started as an intern. Okay. (laughs) That's fair enough. He's come a long way, man. Uh, Even... I remember when There Will Be Blood came out and Tarantino made that video reviewing it. And he was like, my only criticism of the movie is that Dano is so weak compared to Daniel Day-Lewis. And even at the time, I disagreed with that. But I think he's one of those guys where he, he finds roles that really suit his his instincts as an actor of sort of like Barry Keoghan. He's like our American version of that, bit bit bigger. Oh, yeah, uh, he'd beat small. the shit out of him. No, he'd be pummel him into the ground. No, No disrespect to BK. But he's awesome. And yeah, it was very funny. Great use of social media and meme culture uh, and how these things can have an impact on the real world. Dude, and Sebastian Stan is a very underrated actor, I think. I think he's starting to get more uh, gigs, more roles, and like more prominence. I mean, obviously, as Winter Soldier, he's been in these big movies and people know who he is. But in terms of like expanding his range, I think he's had a very good past couple of years. No, dude, he's one of the best MCU actors who have done a good job branching out and finding smaller movies where he's not necessarily the, necessarily the lead. He plays uh, supporting roles well. He was good in Itania. He was good in Fresh last year. And uh, yeah, and this year he was, he was good in that too. He's going to play Dumb Donald one. Trump, right? Yeah, he is. Hell yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's going to come down to the voice because there's so many great uh, impressionists out there like... Um, uh, Shane Gillis, his Donald Trump is the best I've ever heard. <laughs> uh, 17, I had Blackberry. One of my favorite performances is Glenn Harrington. He's one of my favorite actors ever, obviously, from Always Sunny. Like, just 
knowing how great he is at just being a complete manic psychopath in that show and let, letting him do that in a, a movie like this when he really is able to really explode and just be a crazed lunatic. It's awesome. But another movie that it's like Blackberry growing up was the iPhone and like it, it really controlled like everything you were doing socially when you were, when I was in high school and they kind of just disappeared, but like it kind of gets left out as being the, the first smartphone and kind of the, you know, the introduction of the whole, like to the world of like where we are now in terms of technology and what we can do with just a cell phone. So um, seeing how that was all developed, it was pretty interesting and kind of seeing the collapse. I thought it was a story you don't necessarily like when, when I heard this movie was happening, I'm like, what are they going to like, what's this going to tackle? What's this going to be about? But I re- ended up really enjoying it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I enjoy Blackberry too. That's a movie I would love to rewatch. And um, Matt Johnson, the director, I've talked about this many times on the podcast, but Nirvana, the band, the show is one of the funniest fucking shows ever created. And uh, a lot of his, uh, the stylistics carried over to Blackberry. So uh, I'm excited to see what he does uh, next. And then 16, I have Mission Impossible, which I feel like gets forgotten that it came out this year. Oh, that's James Bond. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah. Doesn't it? It seems like it just came and went, right? Yeah. Terrible release date. Yeah, that's true. Stuffed it in between movies that people cared more about. Should have just released it in August. And uh, Tom Cruise has uh, left Paramount. And I imagine that played a big role into it. He, he's now working with, uh, I think it's Warner Brothers, right? Yeah, new action franchise, right? I mean, it's not <laughs> Paramount as good just as- fucked, fucked over Tom Cruise and now he's out. I think Fallout for both of us was probably top 10, right? And I don't think it's to the level as Fallout, but- um, I actually, I'm someone who likes- um, the one before Fallout, the best. The first one with Rebecca Ferguson. Mm. Rogue Nation. Rogue Nation, yeah. But I think it's still up there with those ones. Like, it's in the same category. Yeah, I want to rewatch it, because uh, uh, the only thing I remember about that movie is them pickpocketing the the little USB and the train sequence. But it gun to my head, I could not tell you what the plot of that movie was. The AI, you know? What did they call it, too? They, what was the name for it? I forget, but I mean, I think it's still, when you talk about like action, I think it's still like in the top tier, maybe not like the entity, the entity. Yeah. Yeah, That's a good good name. But I feel like Mission Impossible and John Wick over the past like decade have been carrying this genre. You know, we still get like the extractions, which I think are still very viable and entertaining, but I think there's just a different level that these movies reach. That are uh, always that always deliver. Oh yeah, and uh, Extraction is is definitely in response to those movies. The way that they've raised the bar, not quite on that level, like you said. Extraction two, I really enjoyed, but it's got nothing on the John Wicks and the Mission Impossibles. And it was fun to see Haley Atwell in a major role. Oh yeah, she's really good, just in general. When she came out in that red dress in the first cap, yeah. I think Bucky was ready to just. He was like, God, I hope I fall off the train on our next mission. <laughs> I can't take this anymore. Yeah, that'd be a fucking... I would be so jealous. Like, you're Captain America and you get Peggy? Well, not even, because, like, obviously they're boys and everything, but, like, there was always a hierarchy. Oh, yeah, no. I get get Peggy. Yeah. No, that's that's tough. I set you up with her friend, right? (laughs) Yeah. Was that 16 for you? Yeah, I was 16. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break to shout out our sponsor for today's episode, and that would be Factor. Coming into the new year, I've seen a lot of people resolve to eat healthier in 2024. Well, Factor is the best option for those looking to take better care of themselves by improving their eating habits. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered straight to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Forget frantic lunch preps and rush dinners. Factor's two-minute meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals. I'm someone who does enjoy cooking on occasion, but it can be very time-consuming. So with Factor, you can fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals, all delivered straight to your door. Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, 
snacks, and more to keep you going no matter what's on the schedule. Skip the overpriced takeout traps, traps that I've found myself falling into time and time again recently, end up paying $40 for a $15 meal because of all the taxes and fees. But Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door. They are ready to heat and then eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Not only does Factor offer fast, simple solutions when you're too busy to cook, they also help you stay on top of your goals with offerings like Protein Plus and Keto. You can stay on track, which will definitely come in handy for your New Year goals. So head on over to Factormeals.com NerdSoup50 and use code NerdSoup50 to get 50% off. That's code NERDSOUP50 to get 50% off at Factormeals.com slash NERDSOUP50. Okay, now resuming our lists starting 15 through 11. This math always fucks me up. I always want to say 15 through 10, but mm-hmm. I know that's not correct. Um, so number 15 was a movie. Actually, let me bring up my list. I don't even know what it was. Oh, Jawan. So this was um, an Indian movie that came out uh, earlier this year. Actually, no, towards the middle of the year. Starring SRK and just funny little story. Uh, I've mentioned it before on the podcast. I was talking to my friend Saul Hill. I was like, man, you, you need to see this movie, Juwan. It's uh, starring this guy named SRK. He's the biggest, one of the biggest act, uh, movie stars in the world. And Saul Hill goes, dude, I've been watching SRK movies since I was a kid. So, you know, sometimes there's <laughs> those cultural differences where, you yeah. know, we watch the Tom Cruises and Saul Hill grew up with the SRKs. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, he actually plays a dual role in this. And uh, I said it to one of my friends when um, after watching it, uh, I was like, this this guy might be the single most charismatic actor in the history of the world. Uh, so apparently he wasn't an action star until this year. He had taken a break from acting a lot of dramatic roles. Like I said, he's, he's the, one of the biggest stars in the world, biggest star in India. And he decides at 57 years old, he wants to become an action star. So not only did he come out with this movie where he plays dual roles, he also has a movie called Pathan that came out earlier this year. And I think both are streaming on Prime Video and they're both amazing. Uh, I decided to pick this one because it's just so funny, the dual role that he's playing. It's so obvious that he's the same person, but they won't acknowledge it even a little bit. I mean, there's some meta jokes about it and he's he's incredibly swaggy. Like I said, I, I don't think there's a more charismatic actor working today or ever. So that that movie was just uh, amazing. It's got incredible action, fun, goofy story, typical maximalist cinema uh, associated with Bollywood and Tollywood. And like I said, SRK need him so desperately in the next John Wick movie. So maybe a John Wick spinoff because this dude is just next level charisma. He was great. And speaking of next level charisma, number 14 was Poor Things, starring mm. my dear beloved Emma Stone and one of the best directors working today, Yorgos Lanthimos. This movie was uh, an incredibly wild ride, and I imagine this is a bit higher on your list, and it's going to be higher on a, a lot of other people's lists. And I enjoyed it from start to finish. You know, it was weird, bizarre, surreal. Uh, obviously, it's got the Frankenstein influences, but it's really about how a person comes to be and how the outside world can be so demanding and cruel and predatory and, and how you weather that storm as a, as a growing and developing human being and Emma Stone's performance. There's really not much, uh, there's not enough to say about it. The physical comedy, the way that the character evolves and transitions into, to new roles, into new ways of walking, new ways of talking, new ways of acting it's an absolute beast of a performance and all the performances in, in this are great. Mark Ruffalo. Uh, I think a lot of people didn't know that he had a performance like that in his bag, being the sleazy dickhead lawyer. And Lanthimos, as I said, one of the best directors working today might be from a visual standpoint, his most ambitious and, and most bold film to date. No, this movie looks fantastic. Um, are you, what do you think of the, um, the takes like this is what Barbie wanted to be. Well, I, I think uh, America Ferreira made a good point about Barbie's politics, and it's similar with Saltburn. We might feel like, yeah, this is a, a bit shallow, a bit on the nose, but for a lot of people, that is radical when they see some of the right. things in Saltburn. That's not what they're used to, or when they hear some of the things that uh, Barbie had to say about feminism. Could they have gone a bit further? Maybe. Um, but yeah, yeah I, kinda, I think comparing the two is, um, I, I kind of find it a bit disingenuous. Me too, because um, they're different movies, different genres, doing different things for different audiences. Exactly. Like yeah. People forget Barbie is also Barbie, 
and appealing to young children. So sometimes the message has to be a little watered down and can't be this big, profound type of um, deep and layered commentary. It sometimes has to be easier, digestible to certain certain audiences. So, I, yeah, oh, yeah, I kind yeah, of definitely. I, I've seen those takes and the kind of was like, well, you know, sure. I think Poor Things is a better movie and they kind of tackle some of the same things, but they're also different in a lot of ways. But yeah, you're right. That is a bit higher on my list, but I very much enjoy enjoyed it. Emma Stone is just, um, you know, for lack of a better comparison, our generation's Meryl Streep. She is just a absolute She tank. really is the best, I think. <laughs> just um, like the, you remember the dude in Jurassic Park who had the big sword when he was, you know, cutting down all the vines looking for the Velociraptor? That's Emma Stone carving out a legacy. She's just like, everybody get out of my fucking way. I wish... Amy Adams would like be better, <laughs> not be better. <laughs> she is great, but like take better roles and better movies because like she's always going to be my number one. But Emma Stone is fucking kicking that shit in, and she needs yeah. to start pumping out some heaters to keep that top spot. Yeah, I, I think uh, it, it's weird because it feels like I don't know. It, it almost feels like Emma Stone has had more freedom to carve out what roles that she's wanted to play, and she's been empowered more. Uh, even when you, you know, not even just Amy Adams, but any of the actresses that came up in around that time, early two thousands, you know, Emma Stone is a producer on poor things. Uh, I highly doubt that when Amy Adams was Emma Stone's age, she was producing any of the movies. She was kind of just being told what to do. And it is a shame that she's found herself in so many shitty movies. I hate to pit two redheaded Queens against each other, but they're, they're, they're battling it out right now. We need some Amy Adams bangers coming. <laughs> uh number 13 on my list the great martin scorsese's epic killers of the flower moon uh this movie was kind of everything i, I expected it to be when it's uh dealing with a topic that is so sensitive but martin scorsese has proven time and time again that he is the master of these types of stories whether it be silence or uh the last temptation of christ and i'm really excited about his his next movie uh, apparently Jesus? it's going to be yeah it's going to be another Jesus movie uh, maybe starring Daniel Day Lewis uh who knows no i've uh, interesting thing i saw was like cuz obviously Jacob Baraldi replaced Andrew Garfield in the Frankenstein movie um people are saying Garfield might be Jesus interesting i always felt that uh Garfield and Driver were selected for the wrong roles in silence that they should have been should have flipped. flipped yeah that driver should have been the main focus well, that's like I love Garfield. But. Well, many people have said that Adam Driver is this or this generation yeah. Robert De Niro, um, right. but that was like right on his come up. I feel like now, if this that movie came out, that's viable. Yeah, he'd be the lead. But Andrew Garfield was definitely like when you when you compared those two, he's the leading man. But now it's probably closer to neck and neck. Yeah, and Garfield's another one. I wish he would get some some better movies. I think he could have been good in this one as well. Uh, because, you know, I thought Leo, one of his better performances without a doubt. But uh, the, the character was supposed to be a bit younger. That's neither here nor there. And, of course, Lily Gladstone has been uh, decorated over these award seasons. Well, uh, we still have some ways to go, but she's been acknowledged um, as one of the best performances of the year. And I think my well, only criticism of this movie is that uh, I think that it would have been higher on my list this is obviously in an alternate reality where her character, I think that the movie should have centered more around her. But like I said, Scorsese's a master, some of the best images of the year, one of the best shot movies of the year, best editing. You know, he's got this dream team that he's been it's working so, with now for a long time. It's so funny when you look at Scorsese's like filmography and his characters, like like you said, how Leo should have been a younger character, like watching Wolf of Wall Street and it's just Leonardo DiCaprio. It's like just a young 22 year old about to hit Wall Street. And then obviously with Goodfellas, like with Pesci and De Niro. But then for the Irishman, he just does CGI. <laughs> it's like almost like he always sticks. Like, I don't care. Fuck, this is my this is my actor. He's going to play the character, whether he's 20 through 50. And it's you're just going to have to accept it. But then in the most egregious sense for the Irishman, he's just like, eh, maybe we'll use CGI for this one. Yeah, that was really funny. <laughs> his whole thing with the Irishman, it was he wanted to do it with his friends. He's old school yeah. like that. You know, it's like those old movies where Dustin Hoffman was playing a 30 year old, uh, 20 year old uh, when he was 30, just fresh out of college looking for a job. But it's also let me make De Niro go from 80 to 50 to play 20. <laughs> right. Yeah, that was fun. I saw, um, I've actually watched that movie three times this past year. So it's one of my favorites. The Irishman? Yeah. <laughs> 
And then I um, also watched the commentary. But De Niro, I feel like he's not getting a, a enough love for his performance here as evil and as scary and as wicked a man that has ever been brought to the big screen, obviously based on a, a real life character. And, and I think that he just uh, knocked it out of the park. He was terrifying in all of his scenes. And uh, and he was also very loving and gentle when he needed to be because he was playing the, the role of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, even like the, just the fact that you're able to convince me that Robert De Niro is an old Southern man. That's a triumph in itself. I was waiting. I was wondering how that was going to how that was going to sound that accent, and I, I think he nailed it. Yeah. Well, he's one of the best actors. I'm sure he People has it forget in his bag. That. But yeah, and obviously a lot of the discourse around it being, like you said, like the perspective of where this story is being told, and that's tough. I think um, obviously. Like a lot of people from like the Osage and Native American communities have pointed that out as a, a big criticism. And I think that's something that obviously they would see more than just us. Oh, well, it's tough because it's also like the same like Martin Scorsese. I think it's always been easier for him to tell stories through – well, not easier, but he prefers to tell stories through kind of like these protagonists that range from kind of – anti-heroes to just bad people, you know? That's kind of like what he likes to sink into and kind of explore, I guess, their evil th- through a lens where you, you kind of see the, their, the, the way they develop and progress into kind of who they are. Yeah, I yeah, think so. people had a criticism of Blade Runner 2049 that it's held back by Hollywood because it's got all these Hollywood actors in it. They're trying to sell it to a larger audience and then it kind of bombed. And Killers of the Flower Moon, I think you can make the, the same critique and that they insist on giving Leo the majority of the screen time and hope that he's going to be able to sell this movie to a wider audience, and it didn't even make back its budget. So it's Martin Scorsese's movie, so he gets to tell it how he wants to tell it, and obviously he changed around the story uh, to to better honor the Osage characters and the Osage perspective. But that's you know that's why people always say it's not so much diversity on the screen it's diversity off the screen because then that translates that does trickle down you know if this if an osage director or if a native director had the opportunity to tell a movie like this with a 200 million dollar budget it's obviously going to be a much different movie that's not the world we live in so uh, i think for what we got uh i i really enjoyed it and appreciated it martin scorsese you know arguably the <laughs> greatest living director today uh, arguably the greatest American director of all time. So yeah. no, he gets yeah, to do what he wants. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it was Denzel who said something along like those lines of like like Spielberg and I think it was – it might have been Scorsese. He's just like, you know, like Scorsese is a great director, but do, would you want him to direct Schindler's List, you know? Right. Rather right. than Spielberg to having just different perspective and obviously uh, a different upbringing and a connection to a story like that. So. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, and it's also, you know, a part of the movie is that this is a story that was buried in American history. It's not something that's taught. It's not something that it's talked about. Very recent after the events, the FBI kind of just moved on and it wasn't used as this sort of celebratory moment in the FBI's, at the beginning of the FBI, what, what gave birth to the FBI. And so almost 100 years later, we have Martin Scorsese, who is not native, who is now telling the story. And he did a good job commentating on that at the end when he inserts himself as the narrator to an audience that is kind of laughing and jeering. And you see that the way this story has been watered down into, you know, Saturday morning or Saturday night entertainment. Uh, I think we as a society just feel more comfortable talking about these types of things when they've already happened, uh, when it's been decades and decades and decades. So nobody really has to be held responsible. And then the story isn't even told by somebody who descends from the Osage or somebody who comes from the Native American community. It's a story told by a white American man, and that's the world we're living in. And uh, But I think that fact can't be lost on people. And I also think the fact that so many prominent critics on film Twitter, so many individuals with huge platforms, thousands and thousands of followers, people who had no hesitation speaking out on political issues when it was... Donald Trump in office have gone utterly silent when it comes to the Biden administration's support for the war in Gaza, you know, a war where they're using American weapons, American bombs, American troops are on the ground. It is our war. Uh, And many people would say it's our genocide. 
that we are supporting, that we are abetting, that we are enacting. Just the enormous death toll where entire bloodlines of families are being wiped out, men, women, children, civilians, uh, you know, arguably the worst civilian massacre of the 21st century. And I think many of these people, as I said, who were so outspoken politically from 2017 to 2021, who had something to say about every single mean tweet that Donald Trump put out, and I'm obviously no fan of Donald Trump. I've been very open about that on these podcasts. They've just gone silent. Cat has their tongue because when it's their guy in office, I guess they have to stand pat. They have to defend the team. They have to defend the creed. And human rights suddenly suddenly don't matter. Equality suddenly doesn't matter. And I, I think it's it's shameless for them to, you know, put a movie like this on their on their best lists, a movie that is quite literally about the systematic genocide of a native population, where they are systematically trying to eliminate the bloodlines of the Osage community. And that is exactly what we're seeing in Gaza. When people say extended families have been wiped out, entire bloodlines have been wiped out. And so many people are still, they just won't speak up because it's a a Democrat in office, because it's their guy in office. And they'd rather go down with the ship rather than acknowledge that it's sinking. And I think it is shameless for so many people to put this movie on their list without having the bravery to talk about contemporary atrocities. But Killers of the Flower Moon, with that said, still one of the best movies of the year. And uh, that's why I have it number 13. Yeah, I have it, I think, right at the same spot as you do. Uh, Number 12, uh, this is a movie that I saw back at TIFF, Perfect Days from Wim Wenders. Saw two Wim Wenders movies this year. Uh, That did not make my top 20, but that was also really good. And this was one of the most enjoyable movies uh, of the year, uh, starring Koji Yakusho, who is uh, a man who cleans toilets in Tokyo, inspired by real life toilets that were built during the pandemic as a show of appreciation to the citizens of Tokyo for staying inside. Uh, They built them all these state-of-the-art public toilets that are absolutely beautiful. And it's literally about a man who spends every day uh, more or less the same schedule, cleaning the toilets, listening to his favorite tunes, reading his favorite books, going to his favorite bathhouse, watching some baseball, catching up with uh, some of his his work buddies. And uh, the routine, like I said, more or less stays the same, but there are little changes day to day. And and you're just so inspired by watching this guy and his Zen-like existence be tickled by the little changes in his routine and just uh, enjoy every moment. And that's really what it's about. It's about taking in the moments uh, day to day, living in the now and how difficult that can be for some people. So it inspired me for about a week to live in the now. And then, of course, I just became a crippling (laughs) ball of anxiety. But for those that week, that was a special week. An incredible, incredible soundtrack. And uh, once again, Koji uh, Yakusho, the last five minutes or so, his performance, second to none, might be the best performance of the year. Uh, number 11, a movie that I'm really excited to talk about. This is uh, the third movie in the Roundup trilogy starring Don Lee, the great South Korean action star. Many people would be, uh, many people in the West are familiar with his work uh, in train to Busan and also recently in The Eternals. These movies just keep getting better, very similar to John Wick, where the first one was good. Um, Not quite to the same level. The first one was good. The second one was better. This third one is literally Don Lee just walking around Seoul, putting people to bed, just dirt naps left and right, uh, earth shattering counter body blows. Uh, Each movie opens with the same scene where he's breaking up people robbing a store and he, he's just so nonchalant so casual uh his his catchphrases are so funny he does this little bit every time before he fights somebody who's holding like a really scary weapon he takes out his evidence bag and he asks them to submit it it's and he's just so nonchalant about it and like i said he it's, he's just a bull it's just this hulking guy uh he literally nicknamed the beast cop uh <laughs> it's very light on plot but if you like big hulking men beating the crap out of people this is a movie for you and like i said don lee he's another one i i need in the john wick movies because he's become one of my favorite action stars of all time what's a better nickname beast cop or triceracop see that would be such a fun team up like a it would make so because obviously these movies are not surreal like kung fury but it would make sense the beast cop would just look at him and be like huh reptile (laughs) you wouldn't think much of it if he could get the job done he'll work with him 
I almost put this movie as in my top five just because uh, I love it so much. And that's it's it's weird because this is a movie I feel like I might go back and watch a million times before I die, more so than any other movie on this list, uh, because I just like movies like that. I like oh, with, sure. the, with the fight yeah. choreography is awesome. It, it's so clean. It, it's so well choreographed. And like I said, he's just a boss, dude. Just just. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's it's I might watch it today, honestly, in celebration. <laughs> You're selling it. Yeah, it's great. Can't really find it. Uh, you, you know, you have to go digging for it. But uh, yeah, that would round out my uh, fifteen through eleven. I guess that's my cue. Uh, fifteen. I have a uh, thousand and one. Did you see that? Yes, yes, I did. I recently saw that. Really yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah, I think it's one of the most uh, underrated or at least talked about performances of the year by Tiana Taylor. Um, oh yeah, without a doubt. If I, if I had my own like award show, she would be a nominee for lead actress because um it's one of the most like real performances one of the most like real movies like when you just think of like real life struggles and just uh trying to overcome and situations that really i guess dive into who you are as a person and who these characters are and it was just a great glimpse into those what was it early 2000s yeah New i think starting in the 90s right yeah Maybe late 90s um, yeah, no, the, the, the look of New York City yeah. was just perfect. I, I hate when movies take place at a certain of, time period and don't look like the time period. No, I think it's one of the best um, portrayals of the city in movies. Oh, like yeah. the real, real New York and like real people. So yeah, I, I saw that at Sundance, and I think it was my second favorite movie out of that, besides Past Lives. And yeah, just not one of those movies that are really good that just don't really get talked about or honored or scene I, I just don't get i guess it just has to do with studios right just not putting it out there or marketing but yeah and i also get- think like um it's not a movie that's going to sell like hot cakes um but every year it feels like there are a lot of movies like that um 14 i have american fiction shout out to lucky is- by the way yeah is this on your list american fiction uh no but another movie uh, that i really did enjoy yeah um, and it is getting like a lot of more hype than I thought it would be after than when I saw it. Um, yeah, I saw people like, pushing it for best picture as soon as it yeah. came out. Uh, I didn't really see that. I, I see it now. It's getting pushed for best picture. Um, I want to go that far, but I, it's still one of my favorites of the year. And I wouldn't be upset if it did get a nomination because it is just such a very funny, creative movie with great performances throughout. Jeffrey Wright always been great. I mean, my real introduction to like his ability as an actor was probably like Westworld, but seeing other things he's always been in been really solid. Never really saw him as like a leading man, but I think this showed that he, he can do that and carry a movie. So I'm glad to see him be able to be into that position, deliver such a great performance and the performance in the movie getting a lot of acclaim. And Sterling K. Brown, you talked about, uh, I forgot who you mentioned as being the most charismatic actor before, but I think he might give him a run for his money because no That'd matter be what he's in, well. no matter what he's in, even his voice performance isn't fucking invincible. No matter like what he's in, when he's on screen, he just fucking, you're glued to everything he does. Yeah. I remember that, get, uh, the, first the energy sh- he brings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, first shot of the movie, you, he's crying and I, <laughs> I, I like laughed to myself. I was like, he's been in the, in the frame for maybe yeah. half a second and I'm always, well, I'm already taken aback by his performance. <laughs> And that's the thing. When he gets real and has to do some like real dramatic acting, he can fucking bring it. And I guess yeah. that's like from like maybe his This Is Us days where that's, sh- you know, the crux of that show, I guess. I haven't, I haven't really saw it. But, but even that heard, scene, it's like what he wasn't even in the movie up until that point. Like, where did you pull that out from? Where did that <laughs> come from? <laughs> and it is very funny. And the commentary about like. I guess, um, like black stories and what stories resonate with the public and what stories are being told and what, what are the, what these artists actually want to do versus what they're trying to do. And I also like the the Issa Rae character and her perspective on it too. So like when you're first watching it, you're kind of like, you're introduced to her character. You're kind of like, you know, you can see what obviously they're trying to, to say and what they're trying to show. But as a, the film progresses, you get a little bit more on that side too. And it kind of creates kind of like a complete picture in a very ridiculous and funny way at times. Yeah. The last 10 minutes might be the funniest, uh, any movie has been this year. 
just the when he's writing the screenplays and it's being acted out in front of him is yeah there are a lot of funny parts i've seen the movie compared um and this always happens uh, unfavorably to spike lee's bamboozled uh very similar themes a bit more eccentric a bit more out there for people that i've seen compare the two but um I think that this movie, you know, what holds it back was for me was the some of the dramatic moments where mm-hmm. I thought the satire and the comedy was so good that it was it was almost like Saltburn where I was like, man, I, I expected this Just to turn be it up a little bit. Yeah, I thought Saltburn was going to be like this maximalist, more like Babylon as the movie just keeps growing and growing until it's totally out of control. Uh, and same thing with American Fiction. I felt like they were it was headed in that direction, but then it would take a left turn into this is the character stuff that people expect. It, it's almost a bit jarring uh, how, <laughs> how, how wild it gets. In 13, I have Asteroid City. Oh, yeah. This, uh, this one I really wanted to get on my top 20 because uh, I really love this one. I think it was 24 yeah. for me. We're talking about like just like ac- accumulation. I think uh, a lot of Wes Anderson, those shorts I really enjoy too. Uh, I think a couple of them like I have rated pretty favorably against some of like my 2019 2019- 20 through 15 uh, movies, but I feel like I would just put those in like an honorable mention type because I really liked the, uh, was it Poison? I thought that was excellent. And also the Henry Sugar short uh, film. I loved Henry Sugar without a doubt. The Rat Catcher too. uh, Yeah, Asteroid City. Um, I just love the way the story was told with just the different um, and really getting into like the process of, you know, kind of what a writer does and what maybe a director, how different people can take uh how you could take a story and kind of make it your own in certain ways and kind of having those conflicting at times perspectives uh, it was enjoyable and i mean just from a technical perspective wes anderson you always kind of know what you're going to get but i i just always get in engulfed in his style and i think when it's used with uh some of his better scripts take um like like grand Budapest hotel or fantastic mr fox it really does just create this gripping production yeah a lot of people comp- uh, commented that uh it's a movie about can you engage with the story when you peek behind the scenes right and, uh, it was a very personal movie for him it's similar with uh, the killer for david fincher where they're kind of examining their own legacies through film and the approach that they've taken and how that approach, not necessarily flawed, maybe there's room for uh, mistakes instead of being the perfectionists, right? Because that's what we always associate with Wes Anderson and Fincher in different ways. Uh, you know, <laughs> I got uh, the killer's not on my list, but the first scene when he's talking about all the preparation he did and then he just fucking bricks it. You know, that, that's that's basically <laughs> Fincher being very vulnerable with himself. Like, yeah, you can do a hundred takes, but who? What? What's perfection at that point? That's the. Uh one of the best line deliveries of the year <laughs> when he misses the shot. Just like, fuck. Yeah, it's just fuck. After all that yapping. <laughs> That's a movie I want to watch again. I don't want to say like I didn't get it at first, but like I feel like it took me a while to like get on the same page mm-hmm. where I didn't really enjoy it as like, like something I, I should be like laughing with, you know, at times. Right. Yeah. I just found it boring after a while. Yeah. That's kind of what did it in for me. I feel bad for Michael Fassbender. This is supposed to be like a big year for him. Oh, yeah, I think, right. I think he was he was good in it. But like, obviously, when you think about a Fincher movie, you probably would expect it to be a little bigger than what it was. And obviously, next goal wins. You know, some people were hoping for some maybe, uh, you know, maybe Taika gets back into his will to people bag. But that wasn't the case. Too many threesomes. It's fucking with his brain. Mm. He needs to get back to the, you know virgin taika well i'm sure if you asked him no he's he probably have... having the time of his life <laughs> he's probably having a great time 12 flower moon we talked about it um like going back to like when i was talking about just how great the movies were this year for me i think like flower moon being 12 i think is a testament to that because uh, i really enjoyed it as well i think um like you said scorsese is just just such a great director he's one of the few along with nolan that like Everyone was just talking about oh three and a half hours, three and a half hours, and I think that's one of like the best testaments to a director editor um, being able to make that feel like it's not the time. Like you kind of feel like you time travel. It's like when you make a 
three and a half hour movie feel like it's two, two and a half. Yeah. And I, I think what's, uh, what's so great about killers of the flower moon is you could see that there was, um, there are a lot more moments and, and he's done this before in his films, but it felt like there were more moments where the movie just kind of breathes and lives and, and speaks for itself where he's letting the camera just wander to capture these beautiful sets that they've created. And he's, he's really just taking it all in. And normally, you know, you look at some of his movies, especially Wolf of Wall Street, it feels like there's a cut every three seconds. So uh, I was actually w- watching that last night. I was just I just needed something to throw on in the background. Um, I think Wolf I still of Wall Street, movie, but I think more so than like when I first saw it, when I was just caught up and just how chaotic and how like you know I was I was in I was in it. But now rewatching it, like and subsequent times that I have rewatched it, I'm kind of just like, yeah, can we just maybe take a take a break here for a second? What I think is so funny about that movie's legacy is when it came out, people obviously took the wrong lessons from it. But I think it's going to be a perfect time capsule for future generations 100 years from now. They're going to look back on that movie and be like, wow, this guy really captures the the excess, the hedonism of their society yeah. and how it did them in uh, and how they all took the wrong message from it. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's like compared to Goodfellas, I think – it's easier to take the wrong message from Wolf of Wall Street because I think a lot of people see that and are still like, that's, you know, I would do that in a heartbeat. When you see the money, the drugs, the girls, like that's just, it's like, oh, I would do it differently though, but <laughs> I still would, uh, that's something that I still think a lot of people and especially a lot of young people like aspire and think that's what it is to be like to uh, quote unquote, like make it. Uh, and then 11, I have Spider-Verse. I think still one of, I think when I, I forget where I had it, like in our like mid season rankings. Um, yeah, that first that I, list of mine got totally obliterated. <laughs> yeah, I have movies that aren't even in the top twenty anymore. Yeah, I think I had like Barbie in there, but I, I still think it is deserving of um, to be like right around that top ten because I get there are some problems, and I think we both had some problems with it, especially towards the end. But to what we've gotten, I think it's still to the standard of the first movie. Maybe not as good but like just slightly under and i think that first movie we both consider to be well i think we both had it in our maybe top tens that year Um, yeah definitely and i i think the quality is still there i think there's been a lot of discourse around it for that's why i gotta get off twitter man because like i say these things and i just see like maybe one tweet that like said it sucked and i'm like oh people people are turning on spider-verse um I think rewatching it too, it's just a, a lot of fun. It's very funny. And I think just the animation style and the way it looks is just one of the best looking things I've seen this year. And I know that's not the end all be all, but I think this, I think when you look at the story and the characters, I think it's it really would be if it wasn't for the boy, the Heron, probably the favorite or my favorite to win best animated feature. Yeah. I think that's where uh, some of the arguments I saw were, you know, people were saying it was too much of a visual feast. I, I loved Across the Spider-Verse. It did fall in my list to uh, 29. But like mm-hmm. I said, the, a lot of these movies that are in, that it's surrounded by, is like Susan May, Bottoms, The Holdovers. These are all movies I gave four stars. Mm-hmm. So um, it's in good company and I, I really enjoyed it. Can't wait to rewatch it. I liked Bottoms. I watched that the other night. Yeah. So did uh, Kareem that's... Abdul-Jabbar. I did see that. Uh, Shut up, nerd. I fucked your mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the, it's such a good, it reminded me of, um, what is it? The Chris Evans movie back in the day? What was it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not I mean, another team movie? Right. Maybe not as ridiculous, but it, I, I more of a family guy. It felt yeah. like family guy. <laughs> it felt like just like a family guy cutaway. I wasn't expecting it to be like that, like, ridiculous in a good way <laughs> well i love the opening when rachel said it's like we need to get laid or else we're gonna be you know just these washed up women in our late 20s <laughs> yeah. and they look so old <laughs> <laughs> just so funny dude. uh marshawn um, lynch maybe one of my favorite performances of the year dude, dude oh, the comedic great. timing on that guy is he's he's excellent he's like why there were no female presidents <laughs> Or is yeah, it- <laughs> when, when they like when they when they uh when, like I like when he buys it and something happens where like they do him wrong and then the next lesson is 
shitting on women. Well, I love when he's there when they he first attends the club and they just punch the girl in the face and he's like, "Whoa, I don't know about this shit." <laughs> it was just such a funny delivery. <laughs> Oh, man. And I, I think Ruby don't... Cruz was, you know, Io Edaberry, Rachel Sennett, they're both hilarious, but I thought Ruby Cruz was maybe the funniest character in that movie. Just such a delightful little uh, psycho uh, with a heart of gold. <laughs> Where she gets the shit beat out of her. <laughs> no, she got the, just the crap beaten out of her, dude. <laughs> I think all football games should be played like that. Yeah, that's good. Okay, number 10, a movie that I was wondering if it would stick around, and uh, yes, indeed, it did once again. I do not recommend this movie to anybody. Do not watch this. And if you do watch this, do not blame me because I'm saying it right now. I'm telling you not to watch it. Uh, that would be Skin of a Rink. Ah, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Skin of a Rinky Dinky Dink, the supernatural horror film from debut director uh, Kyle Edward Ball. We've talked about this movie many times. We had the pleasure of watching it with Nash and Teddy. They absolutely hated it. And then we reviewed it which was so funny. What a, what a funny little thing we've got going on here. But I, I thought this was one of the better debuts for a director over the last few years. And I'm just so excited to see what he does next. And I, I've talked so much about this movie, so I'll keep it short. It's um creepy, scary. Uh, one of the best movies to use just um, angles and uh, interior to create a, a creepy vibe that uh, just keeps growing and growing throughout the movie. And one of my favorites of the year, so it makes my makes my top ten. And I, like I said, I'm so excited to see what he does next. You know, yeah, because just in terms I'm of forward to that too. Yeah. Well, it's like I respect because it's very close to being. Um, you ever see the Parks and Rec when uh, I forget what character it is? They have like a assignment to capture melancholy in a photograph, and Ron just takes a picture of an empty desk. <laughs> it's like here you go, melancholy, lonely <laughs> desk. Um, but it's not that. I think like, you know, it's – you can kind of take what you want from this movie and, you know, it, it's it's more than just somebody taking pictures of hallways and windows <laughs> and like – and just being like, oh, look at – see how sad this is? There is a style to it and a, a, and a, um, definitely I, I got a lot of that because this does – it is a feeling – that is very hard to express. Like when you're just in an empty house, but you don't know why it's you're sad or why it feels lonely or it's dep- depressing. It just is. And I think to be able to like to see that and like be able to capture that through um, this cut, this movie by taking like the like you said the angles, the shadows, and all that. I think that's it's it's not as easy as I think like someone like Teddy or Nash would think it is like, Oh, what you just go around your house with a camera. I could do that. Yeah. There's- yeah. It's always obvious when it's done. And I think yeah. there was a, you know, the, the idea of when you wake up in the middle of the night and you think you see somebody sitting in a chair and you realize, Oh, those were just clothes that I piled up. Or when, uh, you know, you're walking through the hallways and you can't really find your doorknob. That happens to me all the fucking time. I'm like, where the fuck is this doorknob? So, you know, throughout the movie, when things just start changing, obviously it's a bit more surreal and abstract, but I think he captured something that uh, many people have experienced. And it's one of those where you can have that explained to you and still be like, oh, cool. I I still hate the movie. I'll never watch it again. That's why I want to shout out one of my favorite follows on Letterboxd. I've mentioned him a few times since. He wrote one of the funniest uh, reviews for Skin of a Rink. He gave it half a star. (laughs) Uh, and he was like, this is horror for folks who consider black pepper too spicy. This is horror for <laughs> folks who get off on watching wet paint dry. This yeah. is horror for those who consider ASMR high art. I do love ASMR. I don't know if it's high art, but his review no, was just I, so great. And uh, a lot of my much, mutuals on Letterboxd just gave it the old half star. <laughs> yeah. As much as I like when I talked about like Killers and Oppenheimer being like, oh, it's so impressive. Make such a long movie. feels so tight. This is such a short movie that feels like it's gone on for five hours. Yeah. Um, and that's not always a bad thing. I think The Lighthouse, that's a movie that I felt like I was in the theater for like three days. But I, it was my favorite movie that year. I loved it. But it is just it, – it's, it's a funny thing the way yeah, you can manipulate. Eggers, Eggers didn't give us anything this year. No. Washed. Man, I really liked um, Pattinson Merchant. (laughs) God, I can't even remember the name of his Viking movie. What was the name of that? That wasn't this year. No, it was last year. I liked that movie. What the fuck's the name? Oh, The Northman. Yeah. Yeah, they were in the North. All right, number nine. uh, This is a movie I think 
will be appearing on your list as well. And it's uh, appearing on many lists. Anatomy of a Fall. This was uh, a movie that I really much enjoyed from Justine Same Trite. spot. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Number nine. Love a courtroom drama. And uh, this one was, uh, I wasn't expecting it to feature as, uh, as much 50 cent music. Basically just one song, but <laughs> it plays an integral part in the movie. And uh, I put on my review on Letterboxd that the, the courtroom in front of all these people for the a trial that's been publicized is probably the worst setting to try and understand the intricacies of a relationship between husband and wife or husband and husband, whatever it is, between two people, between a family unit, uh, the way that uh, perspective comes into play and that you can really, you can never really truly know what's going on between two people because you can never really truly know what's going on with an individual. And I love the way that the movie plays with your expectations, uh, made me feel guilty at times for thinking that this character played by uh, Sandra Huller was guilty of the crime as well. Uh, and then it made me feel <laughs> guilty about that when I see her going through what she uh, what she has to go through in this movie, you know, the way that uh, the walls of her life are being torn down in such a reckless and vicious way. And, and I think a lot of yeah. people enjoyed the supporting performances from the lawyer that was uh, on the um, prosecuting team, hater of the mm. year, I've seen a lot of people call him. And then the lawyer that was defending her, uh, a lot of people have been referring to him as uh, the hot lawyer. The hot lawyer. Yeah. Daddy lawyer. Um, daddy lawyer. <laughs> he was absolutely fantastic. And I said, this movie yeah. is just, um, it's one of those just bad law. <laughs> right. It's one of those where, um, it's not the best movie of the year, but it's the best movie of the year where it's just got <laughs> so many different things that most people come to movies for strong narrative humor moments that will scare you moments that make you think it's it's philosophical at times it's never really that pretentious so i think it's very appealing and accessible to most people you know it's a movie where obviously it's it's in german and french mostly french and some english but uh, i feel like for, for a movie that's this engaging some people who struggle with subtitles i think that will be all washed away because right from the beginning you're like why is this so it was right in your face it's intense right. from the very opening scene and it doesn't let up. And, and in my opinion, it just keeps getting better and better and better. So that was number nine for me. Yeah. I think what makes this performance so great too, is like, like what you said, like you just don't know, right? Like you can, in the beginning, you're like, oh, she did it or she didn't. And then by the end, you have to make that judgment as an audience member based on what you think you know about this character. And even though it was kind of spoiled at the Golden Globes, but- uh, Oh, was it? Yeah. Um, what the fuck? It's like, I don't know, do you believe this character? Do you trust her? The time you spent together? And I think it really, this whole time you're dissecting and it really makes you, that's what makes you get to know this character. And I think it's an interesting way to kind of view a movie. I mean, it's not the first time, like a whodunit or something like that, but in such a a real sense, I think it's it's a very intimate, like you really just throw yourself into this kind of family unit and see and kind of come to your own decision by the end. Um, two of the, the best scenes or most well-acted scenes, I think, um, when she's giving the testimony about her son uh, in the court and then obviously the, the fight scene, I thought was very well done. The way they were able to take you into that moment in time, get to really know these characters in a way that's kind of you know, if you put yourself in her shoes to be in that that forum with these strangers looking on and trying to defend yourself and just getting the reactions and the uh, feel of the room, I thought was very well done. And like you said, great supporting actor, Snoop. This should be a category for dog acting because like that dog was dying. Yeah, good dog. I don't know how he, I don't know how he pulled that off. Did he go method or what? But <laughs> <laughs> that dog was dying on screen. Yeah, I don't know what the hell. They, I, I don't want to know the behind the scenes for that. Um <laughs> that was Snoop number 2. Yeah. <laughs> so, I've seen a lot of marriage story comparisons and obviously the big fight scene. Um I think it's a different way to tell that kind of story and but I think they both did a very good job of showing the you know the the fractures or the intimacies of a relationship and this was a marriage story being dragged in the streets for everybody to just flog <laughs> this poor woman <laughs> this. yeah it's like yeah you can see like marriage story like brings you into a unit this one uh it's like a family dynamic this movie 
brings you into it in a place of like judgment. Yeah. It's like, what if everybody else had an opinion on Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson's marriage, not just yeah. them? It's like being broadcasted to the whole world. I mean, obviously, man, literally is being broadcasted to the whole world, but in the sense of the film. Um, yeah. And the young man who plays um, Daniel Milo Machado Groner. One of the best uh, first time performance. I think this is his first role in a movie, and he was great. The subtlety that he brought to his role, uh, you can just uh, you see the sadness in this poor kid. And I, I guess that's just the French in him. The French are just born sad. Uh, number eight on my list, um, movie that many people have enjoyed, um, Godzilla minus one. This Ooh. was um, one of my favorite in theater experiences. Saw it twice in theaters. Wish I could have went to uh, see it a couple of more times. This was so much fun, and uh, anybody who's been listening to the podcast knows that I love Godzilla. To me, it is... Uh, I haven't seen all the Godzilla movies. Uh, I've seen quite a few of them, but not all of them. So uh, I don't know. Maybe there's another one out there that is uh, as good as the original, but I think this was the best one since that original 1954 Godzilla, taking it back to its roots, obviously with its setting even going uh, you know, 10 years before the original takes place, right after World War II. Uh, I love the political commentary, uh, especially with uh, the world we're living in now when it comes to the rise of nationalism throughout the world. And, and this movie is a stark reminder of what that time period looked like when we had all these countries that were so proud in ways that ended up bringing them to the doors of destruction. And uh, obviously, there's a lot of criticism to go both ways. I also just appreciated how you know, how scary Godzilla was in this movie. He was an absolute force in nature. Every time he showed up, I, it's the first, I've been scared of Godzilla before, but I was terrified every time he showed up. You know, normally you're excited. It's like, oh, Godzilla's going to do something. I'm like, no, Godzilla's going to kill like tens of thousands of people. He, and he was yeah. fast. He was like Thanos. He was moving fast. And I love the way that they used like the, you know, the remnants of the war, uh, the mimes in the in the ocean, it was still carrying over. You know, you could still see the after effects and the shock and the trauma. And, uh, and it grounds the story uh, with these two human characters who come together, this family unit in the face of all this devastation. And I, I think that's why it was appealing for so many people because it was uh, at times it was very melodramatic, but I found it very effective as well because the performances were heartfelt. It's dealing with the survivor's guilt of uh, the kamikaze pilot who just couldn't get the job done. And many people would say, yeah, that's because, you know, you're, you're a normal and you shouldn't have to you shouldn't have to have been forced to make that decision. Um, right. And then yeah. there was a real celebration of, you know, fighting to live, not fighting to die, you know, not dying for your country, but living for the next day to build a better future. So simple, but very effective. No, it works on like those two fronts so well, like you said, just these like these character moments of these people just trying to like what now after surviving all this destruction and mayhem, trying to pick up the pieces of their lives and move on and find someone to do that with, raise a family, um, make these connections and friends and kind of just look towards the future. But also there's fucking Godzilla. Yeah. <laughs> and it is fucking... Uh, <sighs> Like, like you said, I've, I haven't seen all the Godzilla movies. This might be my favorite portrayal. Just the scale, like you said, the the terror he brought, the design of the character, the blue, the way his tail kind of like cocked and locked in before he was ready to fucking explode. Yeah, Just that scene this- is so uh, long. Like that moment when his tail is yeah. charging up, it's like a 20 second sequence. <laughs> the sound design is fucking incredible. Sound design is uh, amazing, you- yeah. The use of the score at the end is one of my favorite. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. It's one of the hardest drops of all time. And a um, great yeah, four man crew. A, that's a left out part. Yeah, such a great crew. Great action sequences. The plans they were coming up with to try to face Godzilla. And like I said before, like in a previous podcast, I don't need this sympathizing with Godzilla. I don't need to be like, oh, it's scared of us just as much as we are. No, we kill the lizard. We're going to break its fucking mouth open and explode it. Yeah, that seems to be, uh, I mean, obviously the Japanese movies eventually went for that as well. Um, yeah. Because the first Godzilla is killed. That was the objective. And then a new Godzilla shows up. He's like Godzilla's son. He's mm-hmm. a bit more friendly. But yeah, no, even Shin Godzilla, one of my favorite movies of the year, uh, Hideaki, uh, Hideaki Anno, who's a uh, writer and creator of Neon Genesis Evangelion, and he used that Godzilla movie to explore modern 
bureaucracy? How do you respond? How do governments respond to disasters, whether they be natural disasters or man-made disasters? And the way that the politicking, even in the face of disaster, still continues. There are people still wheeling and dealing, backdoor dealing, trying to move up, uh, trying to use this moment as an opportunity to build their own careers. So I really appreciated his take on it. And this was a bit more simplified, a bit more old school. The themes, uh, they feel more universal, the more humanist themes, you know, bigger ideals. In both instances, I really just appreciated both takes on them. So uh, I think that even though it's a movie that takes place in the 40s, it feels very modern. And I think that's what some of the Godzilla movies that we make in the West are afraid to do. Uh, Movies in general, we're just uh, so terrified of the modern day. Uh, Everything has to exist 40 or 50 years ago or in the future. But yeah, like I said, Godzilla minus one the best since the original for me. And it like has these emotional moments that are genuinely heartbreaking and cause a reaction. They're not just thrown in there for just some Bro, I would have got down on one knee as soon as I saw <laughs> Noriko in that secretary outfit. I'd be like, you're not get, you're not leaving this house looking that good without a ring on your finger. <laughs> I know he was going through a lot, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But come on. But- generally like tear worthy moments oh god dude the the final line of that movie there's only one final line in a movie this year that hit harder than that one Uh, Um, iron claw Claw. but um when that moment just thinking about it right now could bring me to tears uh just a great great ending and a lot of people didn't like the way it ended but fuck it i did oh i loved it uh number seven on my list my beloved Miyazaki, The Boy and the Heron. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a movie that I really expected it to be tough on, but it was a great year for movies. And, um, you know, I, I've talked about Miyazaki so much that I think he'll forgive me for putting him number seven. But this is a movie, the more I think about it, the more I really love it. And uh, he retire again. He might. So the rumors are that he's going to make a sequel to Nausicaa, The Valley of the Wind, which was um, technically the first Ghibli movie. That would be, it's one of his best. And the fact that he maybe wants to do a sequel makes me so excited. But uh, this was the perfect um, swan song, perfect way to say goodbye. So of course he's going to come back. And, um, you know, it feels like very much a a greatest hits, but it's also got a lot to say about his own life, his own legacy, um, the sacrifices that we make for art, not only on an individual level but a collective level as well like with the parakeets and uh all the animals who have been starving who have been suffering so that this one man could keep this fantasy magical world going and there's one scene in particular when um they reach the so-called heaven of the world when the parakeets ask is this heaven and the way the score changes it, it's, it's giving me chills right now talking about it i think uh Hasaishi, i think that's how you pronounce his name i'll probably go back and edit it He's done such great work throughout Miyazaki's career and, and on other Ghibli movies as well. This might be his magnum opus. Uh, best score of the year. Uh, just uh, so sentimental whenever I listen back on it. And like I said, the movie is a you know boyhood odyssey with um, one of the best voiceover performances on both sides, both Japanese and English throughout the cast. Um, I will say Robert Pattinson, I'll never say the dub is the definitive version. But mm-hmm. his performance as the Heron was incredible. And that guy is just such a, he just gets it. He just understands what it is to be a modern actor. Um, now, sometimes that can ruin it. I watched like a clip of One Piece dub and I'm like, I don't get how anybody finds this enjoyable. Yeah, if you watch it first, it's always easier. If you watch the Japanese and then go to the dub, you it's very noticeable how shitty dubs are. <laughs> it's not even that they're shitty. It's just, it's tough to make a good dub, but... This dub was um, maybe the best yet. And like I said, it's um, another Miyazaki near masterpiece um, and another yeah. movie with the final, the final few frames of that film. Just uh, it's life affirming, you know, it makes you want to <laughs> go out and do Lid. something. Yeah. With your buddies. Yeah. Uh, and number six, The Taste of Things. Uh, this is a movie that I will probably rewatch many, many times throughout the rest of my life. Um, uh, food porn has never looked better. Watching this on an empty stomach is you just asking to be miserable. And um, I didn't necessarily watch this on an empty stomach, but I sh- probably should have eaten a bit more before watching it because uh, food has never looked more delicious. And it's starring uh, Juliette Binoche and Benoit Magamel, who I mentioned earlier for Passive Fiction. And it's a bit of a love story about um, a cook and uh, a gourmet. You know, they have this sort of tension. Will they, won't they get married? They've been working for so long and uh, their situation is essentially marriage without the ring. 
So there's a nice little tug of war between them in the midst of them making some of the most delicious food that I've ever seen on screen. Like I said, I love food porn in movies. It's not the last food food porn movie I'll talk about on this list. Like I said, the love story, it's lovely. They have such great chemistry and it's such a mature love story. There's a lot of care. There's a lot of tenderness without being uh, explicit or, or crude. Uh, it's just one of those classy movies that makes you want to fall in love and cook food with that special person. Cannot tell you enough. Oh my God. So delicious. And uh, Benoit Magamel, once again, a, a totally different character from what he's playing in Passive Fiction, where he's a more sleazy politician. Here, he's just this very loving, wholesome uh, teddy bear gourmet who's very passionate about food and passionate about the woman he loves. And she was just as charming as he was. So I couldn't recommend this enough to people who love food and romance. I hate one. I, I, I don't hate it, but watching a movie where they're just chefing it up and, you're, and you know you can't have that. This truly, like Tom Popo is one of my favorites for that reason. Uh, the Bears obviously got some great food porn opening night. No, not opening night. Uh, the big night, I think, the Stanley Tucci one. This sits above all of them when it comes to food porn. Oh, God. Mm. And the, some of the desserts they made, it was, mm. like, offensive. I was, uh, <laughs> Dude, my crowd was, like, moaning and groaning throughout the movie. <laughs> I'm like, moaning and yeah, groaning. Every new dish, just they were like, ooh. You, you just said dessert, and I was like, ooh. Yeah, so that's my uh, 10 through 6. Well, you mentioned it briefly. My 10 is Iron Claw. Yeah. That last line of the movie left me and the other gentleman in the theater just in shambles. Uh, yeah, I was like, holy fuck. <laughs> Very awkward. When you're, when, when, when you're in a movie theater with just two people and you can hear each other sniffling, and you look over and you're just like, not a word spoken, but, you know, <laughs> that's, I would die, like, if he needed ever needed anything, I'm here for him. It's just that bond, you know? No, it's like it is a special bond, together. right. Um, you'll probably never see each other again but you'll never forget each other yeah no no like it's like i either have to fight him or right that's what i was gonna say one of you can't live (laughs) yeah who's gonna spill Uh, the beans that you guys were crying (laughs) and two of my favorite needle drops ever is don't fear the reaper and uh tom sawyer this movie had them both it's like just two songs that like that come on and you're just like fuck yeah let's do this (laughs) yeah the tom sawyer one is uh it's something about that, that those those songs. You're just like, it's the ultimate hell yeah. Guys will see this and say hell yeah. It always reminds me of the Family Guy cutaway with uh, the Cheeto Man. He's like, there's <laughs> yeah. no better drummer than Neil Peart. I think they're listening uh, to Tom Sawyer. <laughs> so when it's like, it's not easy being cheesy, and does the line of cheese dust. <laughs> it's not easy being cheesy. <laughs> Interesting story. Not one that I really knew about. It's big. Like I think if you're a huge wrestling fan, you probably know about the uh, uh, the story. But um, seeing it play out, and and to find out, like from the director, that there's another brother, like who also fell into tragedy. Like, and they had to leave it out because they thought it would be too ridiculous for people to comprehend this much bad things happening to one family. Yeah, I saw like that, it, and now it makes sense after watching the movie. That would have been unbelievable. <laughs> like it, 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 like if this was wasn't a true story, I think a lot of people would have left this movie being like, "All right, well, we know what you're doing. You're just trying to tug at our heartstrings and manipulate the audience." But like, no, this is this is just what fucking happened, and it's so fucking insane. And in the setting of professional wrestling, um, I thought like it was just. I can't say it was a great way to tell the story because it was a true story, but I think it just adds another element of to it all, especially when you when you factor in the father and the type of father he was to his children. And, you know, I think that's the, you know, his presence is basically the overlaying factor of everything that happens to this family and what goes wrong. And it, it is just um, a real gut punch at the end that um, – one of the few times like I was just like visibly like or like just rattled for like the next couple hours. <laughs> that last line, man, I tell that was just after seeing everything this man went through and to have his own little slice of happiness, I, I and that one line just basically wrapping up uh, everything that's happened up until that point in such a concise manner, like it was just perfectly executed and Zach Efron I think isn't really I don't want to say like he's not respected as a good actor because I don't know if he's really been in too many opportunities to show 
how talented he is or c- can potentially be. He was all right in the um, the what was Dahmer? It, Dahmer. Was it Dahmer or one, one of these other guys? No, he uh, Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. I think he was pretty good in that. Um, and but other than that, he hasn't really had anything to. I think he's really tried, but the movies have into. stunk. Yeah. So this was actually a good position for him and uh, a good role for him to take because I think he delivered and the movie was very good as well. So I think some people have been talking to him potentially as a best actor. I don't think he gets it this year, but I think he's kind of showed a lot of people that he's a very legitimate actor. And Jeremy Allen White, I think, has done that for a while. But again, I think he delivers a great supporting performance as well. Yeah, I'm surprised this movie isn't getting more love, that more people aren't talking about it. Uh, I think what's most impressive is that it never betrays the realism of the story with your typical Hollywood cliches. It very much, uh, as they said, they had to take out some of the the real aspects of the story because of how devastating it was. And it truly is uh, one of the most devastating movies of the year. And it's also ha- has a lot of happiness and it has a lot of heart. And I thought Holt Mc, uh, Mc- I love him. He's, I think a, he's so good. He's a great actor. And I, I thought that, yeah. you know, Zac Efron was really, really good. Uh, arguably a great performance, maybe worthy of that sort of award uh, consideration. But I thought uh, Holt um, was the best part. One of the best performances of the year for me. And he's, you know, obviously it's easy to blame that character for what happened. But uh, it's so so sympathetic and and so loving, even though he wasn't able to you know cross those certain lines of of being the father that they needed and all those you know in in all the ways that you need to be a father. It was coming from a place of wanting to do right by his family and wanting to have a legacy because that's what's important in our society. And uh, he's just you know they're not cursed; they're just trapped. They're they're yeah. chasing ghosts, and him. In particular, you should have just taken that goddamn music scholarship. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's something where a lot of movies and a lot of music um, that captures this kind of small town feel and just how everyone just seems trapped and they can't escape. And I think it's very prevalent in this film and also seeing, you know, just the camaraderie between the brothers in this situation, um, being together and being each other's fathers in a lot of ways, you know, uh, how they support their younger brother and his his dreams and his ambitions and how they support each other. And like I said, just to have the backdrop of professional wrestling and all the pageantry and what goes into that, I think really uh, is really what makes this movie. Well, that's why it made me enjoy this movie so much. Yeah, the wrestling scenes were intense, dude. Uh, so yeah. well shot, beautiful to look at. And um, I've always said I like the behind the scenes of wrestling more so than wrestling itself. So this little origin story about how it was becoming mainstream, getting on ESPN and uh, all the work that this family did, you know, as you said, more wrestling fans are more familiar with them. I really wasn't. So it was a surprise to see, you know, ESPN and Ric Flair. Uh, right, so it's a yeah. nice little history lesson as well. Yeah, it was interesting to see how it was in the beginning of like the circuits. You know, my whole life was like, oh, there was WWF. East, the WCW. Right. That's how it that's started, really dude. Like people's fucking backyards, you know, traveling the country. That's how it got its start. And uh, yeah, Afron, um, I hope he continues to get roles like this. This, this felt like just the perfect role for him and at this stage in his career. And uh, he delivered. Yeah. And it's like, we didn't like make him get fat or anything. You're like, oh no, just get more jacked. Yeah. No, just um, <laughs> juice. Yeah. Um, nine, Anatomy of a Fall. We talked about that enough. Um, yeah, it's one that I think it is a shame. They finally had the chance to do what I've always talked about. Well, not what I always talk about, but like when there's foreign language category that is a picture that's in the best picture race as well, you obviously know what's going to win. Uh, they had a chance to kind of make it so- somewhat entertaining and leave something up to guess, but Anatomy of Fall won't be the French's submission, right? So it won't be nominated for international feature. No, I think it, I think the submission is going to be the taste of things. So there's an opportunity. I don't think taste of things gets best picture, but I think anatomy. Well, of we could have had zone of interest and anatomy of fall both in best picture and international. Right, and right. It would have been fun, but they stole that from us. Uh, eight boy and a heron. A lot of things you mentioned. I think you've pretty much wrapped it up pretty beautifully. Um, Obviously, you're more of a Miyazaki guy than I am. Not to say I don't like him, but you just have watched more of his movies and stuff like that. 
but I respected how mature it was. Um, uh, just the fantastical elements building this world. Like you said, the score was just phenomenal. I haven't seen the dub yet, but I am interested in checking that out. Um, cause I feel like his dubs are usually pretty well done, right? For the most yes. part. No, they are. So, um, but the original voice performances were very well done. The, the Heron hearing Vanson's was a bit jarring. I'm sure he does a good job with that. Yeah, no, he does. <laughs> He just became a little creepy creature man. Well, and I think we talked about it when we wrapped it up after Tiff, just like taking what you want from it. Like on the surface, you can really just take it as a fun little, maybe not, you know, just a, a fantastical adventure. But when you start digging deeper into certain things, like I, I do enjoy movies that kind of have that multi-layered facet where it's enjoyable on many different levels. And then seven, I have the holdovers. Um... But you have it at 30, so a little bit higher than yours. Yes. I just enjoyed this movie, man. It's just one of those things where you have just a, a pleasant experience throughout. Um, you know, it's not... That motherfucker anything... thinks about the Roman Empire all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's not anything new where you see like an old, uh, you know, grumpy man kind of refine himself in life when introduced to you know, a younger person with a different outlook on life and different perspective, but they kind of can connect on certain things and they grow and f- realize they're actually are good friends. But I think the way they did it, the the chemistry between Giamani and Dominic Sessa was definitely one of the highlights. Uh, and I think the story really did more than, I guess, that old cliche of what what I mentioned before. And I think probably the favorite to win the Oscar maybe now, Divine Joy Randolph. Oh, nice. So just uh, love to hear that. Well, she won the Golden Globe, and I think she's won some other things. Um, no, she, she was the well. she was the best part of the movie. Yeah. I mean, as good as Paul Giamatti was, uh, it's a well acted movie, and I think you know the emotional beats where they come together, and obviously him and uh, his relationship with his father and his troubles growing up. Um, I think it all really played out nicely, and I thought it was consistently funny throughout. Um, and I just kind of liked enjoy, uh, you know. Watching these two people hang out, or these three these three people find family within each other that they don't have, and just just be chilling. Yeah, uh, I think this is going to become my Christmas movie moving forward. I was thinking about it; it might be like one of the better Christmas movies of all time. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of holiday movies to begin with. Yeah, I think it might be like Christmas movies fucking suck. You know, they suck when you have to be like, oh, well, Die Hard. You have to you have to make a case <laughs> for Die Hard to make it your best Christmas movie. Um. Number six, I have poor things. Um, like you said, just the world he's able to create here um, was just because like, I don't know, what would you call it? Like an alternate version of our world, I guess. Yeah. It's like a um, future futuristic, but retro. <laughs> like it felt uh, like a man playing with toys. Like he was creating these yeah. worlds out of sets, uh, playhouses. And he was uh, even the way the characters move, you know, it's very uh, awkward and clumsy. It's like they're dolls on strings that eventually cut those strings off and become individuals. Yeah, this is another one where it's like it took me maybe like 20 minutes to be like to get in on the joke, I guess. Or not not the joke, but like you're kind of like feeling it out, like what's what it's kind of going for in the humor style. And being a fan of Yorgos Lathamos, I think I, you know, picked up on it pretty fast. Uh, Fairly quickly, but once it really got going and just following this character Bella along and kind of like May, December, um, when we talked about like, you don't know if you should be laughing or not. There yeah. were certain points in the beginning where you're like, is this supposed, am I supposed to be laughing at this? Because it's funny. But then when you kind of like think about like the situation where like mentally she's a child, even though it is Emma Stone, you know, and that's like something I don't know if people were like viewing it in that lens or had to get over that aspect of it. But like when she's finding herself and being an adult while also mentally being a child, you know, I mean, that was like a little weird at first. But then I guess you just kind of roll with it. And then um, and there's also I've seen like, I guess women were upset of um, how they portrayed the Bella character finding herself. I don't know if it's a majority or minority in terms of this opinion but like uh that being like sex is the only way like a woman could find herself i don't i don't know i don't know like really the same thing like i guess with scorsese like as a guy i really don't know and i guess it's could be a valid criticism but for me it 
it wasn't. I, I think seeing Emma Stone grow with this character, it might be one of her best performances. Um, and like I've said many times, I'm not a big accent guy. I did see some people say her accent wasn't great. To me, it sounded perfect. Um, I can't stand these accent watchers. Yeah. Same thing with Ferrari. They're like, oh, Pelosi Cruz sounds like a Spanish woman. Adam Driver sounds like Mario. Shailene Woodley sounds American. Who cares? <laughs> but seeing her grow with her performance with this character as she becomes, you know, more into herself and gains knowledge and figures this world out, it really is. I think. I think should win Best Actress. It'll probably be Lily Gladstone, which also deserving as well. But um. And like you said, Mark Ruffalo, <laughs> one of the – what would you describe a person like him? He's scoundrel. <laughs> yeah, scoundrel. <laughs> but playing that character so well, just the most despicable uh, type of person there is who just becomes so goddamn down bad that he ends up in a mental hospital. <laughs> I thought that was just so fucking funny. Just the – just grimy. Um, and somebody and said that, that uh, he kind of – sorry to cut you off. He represents the um, the outside world exploiting Bella's yeah. uh, innocence. Well, it's also like a very real thing that I think many people growing up go through where you have the, the Rami Yusuf type character and then you see this, you know, who everybody else thinks is a scumbag where you're like, eh, it's kind of fun, you know? We'll go to fucking – Travel the world and just go off and have my own little adventure. Willem Dafoe, I thought was great too. Uh, he's just the perfect person to play that type of character. Just this Doctor Franken, deformed Doctor Frankenstein person with the digestion bubbles too. Like <laughs> of all of his creatures running around, just the the perfect guy to encapsulate that kind of that kind of character. Yeah, just the way she's able to maneuver and figure things out. Obviously, maybe it's a, a side effect of the situation of a baby brain going into a, a fully grown body that you just develop at this super fast rate and the way, the way she's able to slowly but surely pick up on things and end up being the smartest one out of them all. I thought it was very enjoyable to kind of all see develop. I wonder if science, if that's a, if that can be done. Um, probably. No one's science. Yeah, science science is crazy sometimes. <laughs> All right, going to uh, top five. Here it is. The five best movies of the year, according to us. This is a movie that I've recently watched uh, maybe like a week ago. I, I saw it on somebody else's best list. That's what, that's what's good about waiting for a little bit. You know, you, you take some time, wait for these other lists to come out, and you steal some of their movies. Uh, Jagar Thonda Double X. Uh, apparently, it's a spiritual sequel to the original Jagar Thonda that came out in 2014. This is actually streaming on Netflix in the original Tamil language. I'm probably not saying that correctly. Watch in the original language, please. Uh, you actually have to search for it. Uh, the title and Tamel to find it. And uh, this is a movie about um, an undercover cop who is pretending to be a director because uh, a local warlord or a gang leader who's become really popular throughout the country wants to become a movie star. He wants to make a movie <laughs> and become the first uh, dark skinned movie star in Indian cinema. And I think it, it takes place in, in about the 70s when Indian cinema is really starting to come into its own. And it is. Um, what you would expect from a movie that is coming out of uh, India and is three hours long and is an action movie, it's uh, balls to the walls, absolutely bonkers. Uh, the main character, talk about a scoundrel. This guy is he, incredibly charismatic. He's great in his role. He, he's like if Beam from RRR was an asshole. You know, he, he's just <laughs> such a wild card. You never know. He, he, typical anti-hero. There's always a bigger villain out there for the villain. That's a line that he says himself. Um, but you never know when he's going to do something good or when he's going to do something bad. He's just uh, so chaotic and uh, eccentric. It's almost like the Tasmanian devil. Absolute wrecking ball. Like when he breaks out into his um, song and dance, it, <laughs> it's choreographed well, but he's just like, he'll just randomly like punch somebody or hit somebody over the head with something. <laughs> and he's a maybe like five foot seven, not necessarily muscular. He's, he's just got like a, like a bro -y look to him. And of course, he can kick the living shit out of anybody. And then the other guy, um, the the second main character, the supporting protagonist who's undercover as the director, terrified of the main character, 
but he puts on this role as the suave and charismatic, confident director, uh, and he pitches him this movie uh, about uh, a biography saying, we'll just make a, a movie about your life. And then, of course, it turns into a whole bigger conspiracy um, that involves the government and uh, other local gangs, and uh, it's epic. Not quite up to the level, I think, of Triple R in terms of entertainment value, but it, it gets very close. Incredible action sequences, an incredible ending, so many good movie references uh, to the legendary directors. There's a lot of nods to uh, Clint Eastwood. There's literally a. Well, I won't actually won't even. <laughs> That's a bit of a spoiler, but a lot of love for Indian cinema and a lot of love for American cinema as well through their references. And uh, it was just an absolute blast. And like I said, it's playing on Netflix. Uh, number four on my list, this was a movie that was in my top five, I think, when we did um, The Halfway Point. This is Kelly Reichardt's Showing Up, starring Michelle Williams and uh, Andre 3000 and Hung Cho. It's uh, got a great ensemble of actors, John Magaro as well. And uh, I talked about this six months back or so. And uh, yeah, it remained one of my favorite movies of the year. Kelly Reichardt's become one of my favorite filmmakers working today. Uh, her movies are in the vein of an Ozu, even um, Kairostami, the same style, slow cinema. And this movie in particular, tackling the just the day-to-day -day sacrifices artists have to make, dealing with their family, their friends, their day jobs, in order to put the work in to create the art that they're passionate about and how you don't always get that recognition that you feel you deserve or that can make it so that art is your full-time job instead of just your part-time job that you have to juggle with all these other things. And there's really not a, a lot of movies out there that celebrate the labor of art. Third movie on the list is, is very similar in that regard, but Michelle Williams is a, another chameleon. You know, you watch her in a movie like The Fablemans, and you think that she's the the loveliest starlet who's who's ever been on the silver screen, a famous movie star from the 30s or 40s. And Spielberg was very intentional in filming her that way. And then in this movie, she is just um, <laughs> she's unrecognizable with how miserable she is. <laughs> like you could tell that she her hair hasn't really been washed. You know, she doesn't really take care of herself. She's wearing bummy clothes. And it's just the the day-to-day -day sacrifices, the day-to-day -day grind of being an artist really weighing on her. And she she's uh, unbelievable, truly. Uh, I think that it, she's almost underrated. I know that she's been awarded with Oscars and she's got that recognition, but she needs to start being put in some of these big dog conversations, you know? She's up there with some of the best. And John Magaro, you know, he's he gives a great performance in Past Lives and he's also really good in this. <laughs> he's another guy that's just good at playing um like a depressed weirdo not really weird in past lives but he's weird in this one and this is another movie that um i've seen people i follow on letterbox watching it and not liking it so don't blame me if you watch it and don't like it. yeah maybe you just got bad taste my third movie on the list is a documentary that i saw a few weeks back this was playing at the new york film festival but it was four hours and those seats are so uncomfortable that I wanted four hour documentary, four hour documentary. So it's called Men You Play Zier. Uh, it's a docu series nowadays. Yeah, it's a it's about a Michelin star restaurant in France that has been passed down from generation to generation in the family known as the Trigos. You're three. This is number three. Damn, what are your top two? All right, go go. So this was um incredible. Like I said, Frederick Wiseman, the legendary uh, documentarian. Uh, if anybody wants to familiarize themselves with Wiseman works, uh, with Wiseman's works, I would say check out the National Gallery documentary he made about the National Gallery in London. It's streaming for free on YouTube. But uh, another epic, you know, the guy's 95 years old and he's still putting out <laughs> four hour documentaries. It's incredible. And this is really just uh, very similar to showing up. It's about the day to day labor of these artists, of these culinary artists, because that's really what they are. And, uh, and explores the way that it was passed down from generation to generation in the same family. And, uh, you know, there's always the talk about Nepo babies, but this movie kind of shows that when you grow up in the business and you're surrounded by it, sometimes that's you're not born to do it, but you are made to do it. And you can fall in love with it because you watch your father and your mother operate this business and they do it with such passion and love and creativity. And they're also good parents. So that carries over. So you want to step into the shoes and do what your parents did and do it as successfully. Uh, and as I said, it's a Michelin star restaurant that's been around for a long time, a three star Michelin star restaurant. And they go into the preparation of the food. You know, so a lot of the moments are just nobody's talking. They're just cooking. But they also go into, you know, visiting different farmers, trying to get the 
different ingredients is, the, you know, all the moving parts that go into operating a Michelin star restaurant. It's an inside look into a process that is so fascinating. So I think it's, it's worth it for a lot of people to check it out if it's playing near you. It's not really playing in a lot of theaters. Obviously, we're spoiled being close to, to Manhattan where they get a lot of those good movies. But yeah, no, it's, it's as good as advertised. And I was happy I got the chance to, to watch it before we made these lists. No, my top two haven't changed since uh, the last. uh, Some movies got really knocked out, like uh, Past Lives. Um, Got knocked out completely. Got sent into the Shadow Realm. I think Past Lives is not in the Shadow Realm. 22 on my list. Mm. Once again, uh, all those movies that are in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, they're mostly four-star movies. So I still really loved Past Lives, but there were, uh, I think, 15 more movies that I watched since that first episode, and a couple of them got the boot. It's growth. Yeah, number two, Oppenheimer. I mean- Mm. Uh, we've reviewed it. We've talked about it all year. This movie kind of speaks for itself. I know you're number one, and I fucking love it. Yeah, of course you know what the number one. <laughs> I mean, that was never that was never going to change. I was wondering. No, I I mean, uh, there was a point where I um I had the edit button and I was hovering over yeah. Oppenheimer, and I thought of putting it number one. I thought <laughs> it, you know it deserves it. It feels like the movie of the year. No, but it, it makes sense. Like you got to keep it though. So knowing what you like, it's either you like something like that or you just like someone vibing. Yeah, no, it, that truly is what makes up my top 10. It's either a guy yeah. beating the crap out of people for two and a half hours <laughs> or it's just nothing's happening. Uh, yeah. Those are my, th- those have become my two favorite movies, favorite types of movies. And then there's Oppenheimer, where, uh, yeah. as I said, I think there's a lot of ways in which the, you know, the ways in which Nolan tells movies sometimes bother me and they bother other people. You know, somebody once said that Nolan's never let a shot sit for more than seven seconds without cutting. And I think that is true. Uh, and I think in in other instances, he could benefit from letting his movies breathe a bit. But Oppenheimer, no. Oppenheimer was the perfect movie for him to tell uh, in this fashion with all the quick cuts and, and hitting on so much information. And uh, I've said it a million times. It all comes together so cleanly for me in the end. Incredible right. performances, the politics, um, probably his prettiest movie. Hoyt Van Hotema really knows what he's doing behind the camera, man. And uh, I'm just, uh, like I said, in Nolan, I've really fallen in love with him just outside of filmmaking. Because I think he's got some movies that uh, you know I don't really necessarily love, and some that I really do, like Oppenheimer. That's why it's number two on my list. But the way he talks about film and film preservation and, and keeping theaters alive, and you know, um, highlighting original storytellers and creatives, he really does feel like the successor for Spielberg, Scorsese, Coppola, in that regard. And yeah, Oppenheimer, like I said, movie of the year for me. It's the second movie of the year. And uh, drum roll, number one, John Wick, chapter four. I mean, this was just, <laughs> yeah, buddy. it was obvious from maybe like the 30 minute mark in the theater uh, <laughs> when we got that overhead shot of them playing poker with Scott Atkins doing that ridiculous German accent, the Baba Yaga. Um, Donnie Yen, <laughs> I can't even talk about this movie without laughing. I mean, Donnie Yen, his first scene, you know, typical snacking on the job. Hey, blind man, you going to get involved here? Just starts wrecking everybody. And then he cuts to John Wick. Oh, what is he doing? He's wrecking everybody. And then there's Hiroyuki Sonata. What is he doing? Oh, he's got a samurai sword. Uh, I saw <laughs> one review of this movie. It was like, everybody in this movie's awesome and hot. And that's why I like it. And that's why I gave it five stars. And I think they really uh, nailed it with that. And then, you know, you have Mr. Nobody. He shows up and he's like a freaky new type of character in this world. First time John Wick doesn't know an assassin. It's like, oh, you're you're a stalker. You're just waiting for the bounty to go. It's just everything about it. The lore is so stupid. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> but they'll never let you know that. They are so committed no. to it. And that's why I think a movie like this, when we talk about Indian cinema just being three centuries ahead of the rest yeah. of the world, this is our you know, submission. Like, yeah, we can do this too. We can be goofy. We can bend the rules of physics. You know, not everything has to make sense. It could be a cartoon. There's no police presence whatsoever. It really feels like a man just trying to escape a violent video game. You know, when Scott Atkins says there's one man who thinks he can buy his way out, serve his way out, and then John Wick thinks he can kill his way out. And then it literally does become an overhead video game at one point. So, no, that's the best shot of the year. Yeah. I mean, There's just so many fucking moments in this movie, dude. Like Lawrence Fishburne, everything he says in these movies makes me laugh. Uh, Ian McShane, he's just a cool old British guy. Even Skarsgård, you know, the the, the stupid French accent. Uh, Clancy Brown, you need an authoritarian figure or you need a a figure that exudes authority. 
you know, ancient authority. That's I, I love about these movies is that you would think that the assassination society or the assassin society goes back thousands of years. Like these customs, these laws, <laughs> they're ancient. <laughs> You know, like they were yeah. around when the fucking, when the Greeks were conquering shit, you know, they like society in Sparta and shit, which I would love for if they did that. John Wick in the Roman Empire. Uh, just uh, one last thing about the John Wick movies. You know, lately I don't get so excited for movies that are in like in the distance. This totally snuck up on me this year. Saw that it was coming out in a few weeks and I was like, oh yeah, they did drop a trailer for that, right? right. John Wick chapter four. Holy shit. We're getting a new John Wick movie. And there's no movies that come out today that completely meet my expectations. Like I remember I rewatched the trailer like a week before it came out and I thought <laughs> like, Oh my God, it's got Donnie Yen in it. He's probably going to be incredible. And he was, it's just, like I said, I going into it, I know exactly what I'm going to get. And they just meet those expectations every single time. We talk about it all the time that we got to start respecting action movies as a whole, but even cinematography. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's, it's what a movie is going for, editing. you know? Yeah. It's why it's so hard to compare movies. How do you compare John Wick 4 to a movie like Showing Up? There's no comparison. You'd be dumb to do it. But I wish that these movies, you know, especially this one, because when you look at the behind the scenes, so much work goes into it. And the choreography, dude, they never, you never lose the audience's attention with the way the action is framed. It's always in the center. Your eye is always following the movements. It's like they've got you in a trance. And that's art. That's, that's part of filmmaking. And I wish it was more appreciated. Right, yeah, so list. those are my top five. My top 20. Now I'm out of right, breath. See what I got. <laughs> Just got to get going on John Wick. It's like fucking natural cocaine. Uh, five, I have past lives, which I think you know was maybe number two last time we did one of these or three. But yeah, I do think it's still one of the best movies of the year. I remember seeing it. Um, that was another one of those movies that – a little different from like something like the Iron Claw, but um, it just sticks with you for a while after. You're just walking around after. It was I saw it on Sundance, so I just remember leaving in the freezing cold. It was snowing. I was just like solemnly walking to nowhere, just thinking. It's like, damn, that was kind of fucked up. Um, well, that kind of <laughs> fucked me up. Yeah. When you talk about just real life situations and just things that are out of your control, like this movie really – uh, has on a full display in such a, I don't want to say relatable because something like this never happened to me, but like, it feels like it's something that could happen, you know? Oh yeah. Definitely. Where, um, and it's just, it's not even, it's, it's hard because it's, it's sad, but like in a, a light, lovely way, you know, there's kind of this optimistic sadness to it. Where like even though it's like what ifs and what could have happened, you're still content in where you are, and that's okay too. But you could still be sad of the the missed time and what could have been. I think a lot of people miss the point of this movie <laughs> when it comes to those aspects. So I've seen well, a lot so? of dumb takes about like uh, I don't want to really get into it, but I think that that was one of the main points, or not if not the main point is that yeah, sometimes a door opens, door closes, but. You gain something from what you lose. Yeah. And um, it's the biggest like that's life. Yes. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> obviously, it's a movie about this doomed romance, but it can be applied for many different things. And uh, that's why it's a, it's a bit universal in the way that it tackles those yeah. ideas. And it's I said this when we first talked about it, like it's so easy and a, a poorer movie would choose this route is just to make that other guy the bad guy. But he's not like it's just what it is. That's just what the situation is. And sometimes that's how things work out. And I think that was funny how they kind of they they played with that in one of the scenes where he's like when when she's like breaking down a story for him he's like I'm the bad guy in this you know that right like people see the story like I'm the asshole right <laughs> but it's um, yeah just a, a movie that's kind of I think lost some steam when it comes to awards but one that I was kind of looking forward to seeing get some recognition but it should get nominations I think Celine Song should get director and Greta Lee might get in there for an actor so that's good well deserved uh four and these top four i think are all five stars we got we got we got the wick we got the wick at four john wick chapter four at number four nice <laughs> yeah like you, i don't even want to like attempt to go off of what you did because i think you just put it so well but yeah, i'm too passionate yeah, these about movies, these movies <laughs> these movies are just the biggest smile i think i've had watching movies just watching this one in the theaters 
just waiting to see what comes next, just laughing at the ridiculousness, but <laughs> always on board with every little aspect of it. Number three, Godzilla minus one. Um, I think it's the it's a perfect <laughs> movie. I really do. Um, just thinking about dun, 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 that and I think, oh, why can't I think of the name of the movie? Overlord. Oh, right. Um, just two movies, like when it's cooking and the sound in that theater is fucking vibrating your seat and you're just in tr- like two of like the coolest theater experiences that I've had in my life. Just like you're trapped in this theater. It's like you're, you're, you're in this, you're in it with them. And it's just, oh my God, hearing Godzilla come up and roar. I think it's the best, <laughs> one of the best sound designs of, of any movie this year. It's so immersive on that aspect and like we said before the human element done so well that last scene just leaving you with tears in your eyes and then yeah i don't want to spoil like the last last moment but i thought that was such a great way to end that movie and it just takes you through so many different emotions uh tackles so many different themes and elements of what movies can be and should be um it's not afraid to like it's not watered down by anything nothing's unnecessary and just that, like we said, that great score, it all just comes together in the end in such an epic and great way where you just, you feel like you know these characters so well, you want them to win, you want to be there for them. It's just what it's all about, man. You know what I love when uh, Captain was complaining about the government and then they get the <laughs> order to pursue Godzilla and Captain's like, all right, guys, we've got no choice. And they're like, I thought you hate government orders. And then as soon as he sees Godzilla, he's like, never mind. <laughs> Captain was maybe the best out of that crew. He was just so funny. Such a great crew. And made for, uh, you know, everybody was talking about, oh, look how good this movie looked. It was made for $15 million. And then the director came out and said, uh, no, actually, it was made for less. I wish I had that much money. Yeah. So Hollywood, no, everyone in what are you doing? Hollywood should be a fucking ashamed of themselves. I mean, I, I have to imagine it's the same thing with all the money we spend on the military. That's got to be a money laundering scheme. Because there, <laughs> there's no way some of these movies are coming out with, with these budgets. Like, what's the budget for Madam Web? If Madam Web is more than Godzilla minus one, they should be they should be arrested. It is going to be. Yeah. Did you the see that promo? The actors alone. Oh, yeah. Did I see it? <laughs> Everybody had the Drewski meme. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. The uh, Dakota know. Johnson salary is yeah. probably more than Godzilla minus one's entire budget. Uh, number two, I have Zone of Interest. Not really a horror movie, I guess. I, I wouldn't say, but I think it's the most horrific movie of the year. <laughs> Just like a nauseating like experience. <laughs> I guess that's the right word for it. Um, but in like a, obviously a good way because that's the intention given the subject matter, but very uneasy, very powerful. Um, and just to, uh, I don't know, display, like t- to kind of just tell a story about like the Holocaust and everything in this manner and show the evils and be this disturbing without actually showing it, I think is very impressive. And I think Glazer deserves a definitely a directing nomination for that. Just creating the atmosphere that radiates off the screen and the uneasiness while watching it. It, it was very, I don't know. It was quite a unique experience when it comes to like, just feeling like that in a movie. Like, and like I said, like it's easy to kind of show the violence and show the atrocities. Um, it's much more difficult and requires a lot of nuance to do that with uh, just having that all in the background while this family is just living this typical quote unquote American dream type lifestyle. It's like another day at work, but instead of going to the factory, he's a officer at Auschwitz. But the way they're just able to block that out just is something you really just can't wrap your mind around. And I think that's really where all the the horror comes. That's where all the horrors come comes from. There. Yeah. No. This was um, one of the most uncomfortable watches. Um, and I love Jonathan Glazer. He's uh, really good at that, making his movies uncomfortable. But they're also just great movies, technically. And uh, this is a movie, like you said, you know, it's keeping the evil in the shadows, and the way that it sort of creeps in with the elements, where you hear the machinery or a gunshot in the distance, or a, heart, a scream, a yell, scream, yeah. you know, the heavy clouds, the, um, the ashes in the lake, 
you know, it well, just cuts a through everything. Right, right, yeah. A pool party. And it's one of the, um, you know, it's a movie that was, uh, I think I had it at number 22 or number 23 on my list. So it was just outside my top 20. And like a, a great movie, a lot of great movies that didn't make my lists. Uh, and it's one of the things that people always talk about when they talk about this this time period. And obviously this man was building the factories. So he was more involved with uh, the Nazis than the average person. But people always say, you know, it wasn't that they, the Nazis were this overwhelming majority. They were an extreme minority. The reason that extreme minorities are able to take control is because of indifference. And I think the, you know, this movie and even Killers of the Flower Moon in certain respects captures the banality of that evil indifference in a way that uh, just gets under your skin. And I think that sort of indifference to it all there's nothing scarier than that. Obviously, when it comes to other movies dealing with the Holocaust, like a Schindler's List, very disturbing and unsettling to watch. That's that's obvious. But I think right. um, you're so disgusted by it. And everybody in the theater is disgusted by it. You're all on the same page. But when you're watching something like Zone of Interest, you're just like, man, this is so fucked up that they're just cool with it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. it's, it's 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 very hard to watch and there's one character in the movie who kind of who does represent that definitely a movie that uh never seen anything quite like it um number one oppenheimer i don't think that's a surprise i think when it first came out and we were talking about it like just there wasn't some hesitancy but i feel like you got to give it time maybe a rewatch and then really reflect on it to be like oh is this a masterpiece is this nolan's best movie um i think yeah on both of those like enough time for me personally, it's safe to say that. I think it's a perfect movie. I think every scene matters. I think there's no filler. And for a three-hour movie, that's such a difficult task. But to be able to pack so much into that and make it flow so well, I think that's a testament to the editing. I think the score is excellent. All the performances are riveting. The writing, like it, every aspect of a movie, I think it excels at. Every time I watch about, every time I think about it, uh, I think I mentioned this like before, but like when seeing it in other times in the theaters for a three-hour movie, if I had to use the bathroom, I wouldn't leave for a movie I already saw already. Like, and I think that's just a testament to it because I know I don't want to miss any second of this movie. I think it's just that good, especially with the state of the world right now. When we talk about moments where we've been on the precipice of nuclear annihilation, and when he tells Albert Einstein, you know, when I came to you with the calculations, with the threat of blowing up the world or destroying the world, and he's, you know, the final line of the movie when he says, I believe we did, and he's just seeing the yeah. weapons go off. I, and they talked about, you know, people have talked about, you know, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where people truly did lose their minds over the the threat of nuclear annihilation. Because it, it was something that was real. It was it was present. And uh, I think on that last scene, and I'm like, yo, I'm starting to feel the kind of that way too. And it, it came out at a perfect time. I, you know, hopefully, it, you know, we, we never get to that point. But it is a Pandora's box that we're living with. And I think that uh, we, we've become numb to, uh, to the idea of nuclear annihilation uh, versus how people yeah. felt about it in the 60s and 70s. And, uh, and I think that, you know, like I said, the state of the world, it's a very real threat. And um, no, it's uh, terrifying thinking of that last scene. The yeah. more I watch it, the more scared I am of those final moments. <laughs> and I, I still see people trying to pass this off as a hot take, which it's not. I don't think it's been a hot take since a week after the release. But uh, the third hour of the movie is definitively the best. Oh, right, right. Uh, it's so good. Um, That's a hot take for people who don't like the movie because by that third hour, they were like, holy shit, wrap yeah. it up. No, but it is truly... Uh, I, a lot of people have said this, but it's true. It doesn't feel three hours. No, it doesn't. And like I said, the pacing, the editing, the the score. Did you see that they were doing the live orchestra on a screening for Oppenheimer? How would they survive that? Because it feels like the score is playing the entire movie. <laughs> yeah. They need to do it an intermission. Stop. For, a, for a three-hour biopic to be as unrelenting as it is, is amazing. I think the only two moments that are like not perfect is when... Einstein appears out of nowhere and hears the whole conversation, even though he couldn't, He's and the, the JFK point, thing. Though. But both of those things, I think, are fucking hilarious and awesome, even though it's not feasible. Oh, let no like, have fun. It, yeah, it's. It, I think they become fun for me, and I look at, I look out for it every time I see it. And the JFK thing is just fucking hilarious. Well, I like the idea. Somebody put this forward. I don't think this was the intention of Einstein. Maybe uh, sort of unintentionally, subconsciously, he's he's just not real. He's like a figment of 
Oppenheimer's imagination, even though they were working and living at the same time. But just the fact yeah. that he was able to hear that, overhear that conversation, and he's like the all-seeing watcher. And even the criticism, watcher. the criticism of Emily Blunt's character not having much to do there for me, and this is something I saw about even before I saw the movie, so I was looking forward to it. But somebody said, um, like the first half hour of her not saying a word, but just sitting in the back. Like when you kind of reflect on that, and once you know everything that's happened with the story and the position they are at that time, it actually I think that's. Pretty, pretty fucking smart to do to put to have her just looming over this thing for the first 20 minutes of the movie, just sitting there in the back like a shadow on the wall. And then obviously it makes more sense when you see everything play out. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's overhyped. I don't think it's overrated. I think it's worthy of being the best movie, then it's worthy of being best picture. And I think many people agree. It's a rare movie that like is so very popular, makes a billion dollars that everyone agree is the best and actually is the fucking best. Yeah, it's definitely the first movie, I think maybe since Parasite, where of course not everybody loved it, but there was never any annoying discourse surrounding it. Um, there was never this huge uh, mainstream term again, turn against it. Like, oh, this kind of stinks now. Like you saw last year with everything everywhere all at once. It's just kind of yeah. the clean... Yeah, it's a it's no, a triumph too, you know, for this movie to almost make a billion dollars. Nobody well, saw most, that coming except you. Yeah, I guess you could well, argue. <laughs> yeah. The most this movie like this course comes is like every month someone will be like, Oh, I wish we saw the bomb. And everyone oh, just shuts that down. Yeah, no, I mean I I I just uh they're like, you know, we need to why didn't he acknowledge the suffering? And it's just um I don't know, people I I I just don't know. I don't know why anybody would want to see that. Go watch. There are movies that have tackled that. Um, I think one of the best is Hiroshima Mon Amour, where it's about the aftermath yeah. of Hiroshima and it's a love story. Uh, how do you rebuild? How do you reconnect uh, amidst, uh, amidst uh, an apocalyptic level of devastation? Kind of like Godzilla minus one in a little bit certain way. Yeah, yeah, seriously. And, um, you know. And there have been animated movies that have tackled the actual dropping of the bomb. And th there are other ways that I think you can explore that. I, I don't think that this, it wouldn't have been, it, it's just, it would have been so out of place. Yeah. Yeah, it, it wasn't that. It's wasn't Oppenheimer's movie. movie. It's his perspective. Right. <laughs> the funny thing was when Obama released his uh, end of the year wrap up, when everyone was saying his favorite character was Truman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, Harry Truman, man, one of my least favorite uh, presidents of all time. Just the uh, the complete opposite of FDR. Fuck this country over in so many ways. But uh, somebody made a point. You know, this isn't really about the qualities of the movies. Uh, just something fun I wanted to bring up that Nolan and Michael Mann both love making movies about the man, the myth, the legend. Um, when you look at Ferrari and other Michael Mann movies as well, you could say that Michael Mann's more interested in the man. Whereas Nolan's always more interested in the myth. And I think that's a fun, uh, fun and interesting way to compare the way that they tackle these so-called great men movies, you know, about these men who did incredible things and sometimes they get too much credit. And I think both of them did a, a good job of sort of deconstructing the myths around them. But Nolan, you know, when you see Oppenheimer being omnipotent or the JFK name drop or the uh, yeah, Oppenheimer uh, suit up scene when he puts on his superhero costume nolan loves the myth and he loves playing to it that i think that really benefited this movie you know at times it, it is a bit it's a, it's silly but it comes from such a sincere place where he's he's geeking out over the the history of it you know name dropping the yeah. scientists that come in and out of his life and you know not really exploring what they did or why they were influential but you know yeah like science nerds probably had like 20 JFK moments. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so all these different characters and, you know, even the historical characters as well. It's, um, it's a, you know, fascinating time in history. So yeah, it deserves to be uh, as celebrated as it's been. I wish one of us would have had Barbie on our lists because I feel like it's uh, another movie that's gotten too much annoying pushback. And I hope it is no, no a nominated for Best yeah. Picture because it's just been a cultural moment. You know, I think it deserves it from that from that regard. The awards are all bullshit, made up political propaganda marketing. So Barbie should be there. Oh, for sure. It's in my honorable mentions. It's fighting for that 20 spot. Uh, Barbie, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. That's like kind of forgotten, but I really fucking enjoyed I that. I saw that on some lists. I really lists. liked it. 
Yeah. That was number 69 uh, they, on mine. <laughs> nice. Uh, they clone Tyrone, Bottoms, uh, Theater Camp, one of the better comedies of the year, Knock at the Cabin, Reality, I actually I really liked. That was a good movie. Yeah, so if, Barbie was, I have it at four stars, and it was very good. There's just a lot of good movies this year. Nimona was good too, the animated movie. Nimona's uh, pretty far down on my list. That's one where I didn't vibe uh, as much with it as everybody else mm. did. I thought it was fun. Uh, Man in Black, another good documentary by uh, Wang Bing. Uh, that's a movie that it's going to throw you off for like the first 10, 15 minutes. It threw me off. A lot of walkouts when I saw it at New York Film Festival, but it's really worth it. It's only 60 minutes if you can get through it. And another documentary that I think is streaming on Amazon Prime, uh, Close to Vermeer. It's about um, an exhibition in Amsterdam of the um, the Dutch artist Vermeer. It's supposed to be the biggest Vermeer exhibition of all time and it, it go it's similar to uh some of the other documentaries uh or um the food documentary i talked about it's about the day-to-day the behind the scenes of how do you put that together the logistics of it all that was fascinating that almost made my top 20 it's just on the outside looking in but there are a lot of good movies um yeah like holdovers uh, you know was 32 on my list love it knock at the cabin one of my favorite more recent Shyamalan films um yeah um what else is there? I mean, none of us had Maestro. That was good. Yeah. Maestro. <laughs> nah. Where is Maestro on have, my list? Where'd you have Runfield? Uh, phew, that's at the, <laughs> in the depths of hell where Dracula belongs. I had Maestro 86. Oh, good. <laughs> like, oh, good. Good for you, Maestro. Dude, another, uh, once again, three and a half stars, but. So much fun. Horror movie. When Evil Lurks. Uh, Spanish horror movie. Oh, God. That movie was intense. Another great one on Netflix, too. Uh, Ballerina. Action movie. R- uh, real simple plot, but the action is awesome. Did you see In My Mother's Skin? No, I did not. I don't know if that's out anywhere or anything. That was a creepy little horror movie. That's pretty good. It looks fucking creepy. Got a lot of um, Pan's Labyrinth to it. In like a respectable way, not like a ripoff way. Dude, even um, Are You There Yet, God? Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret. I've seen a lot of people love that movie. Yeah, I've seen it on a lot of top tens. Uh, Nin- Ninja Turtles. <laughs> I love Ninja Turtles. you see Turtles. Society, Society of the Snow yet? I did. Uh, I didn't love it as much as other people. Disaster movie, it has to have aliens or else I'm going to check out. Because <laughs> I've recently rewatched, um, fuck, the Spielberg. What the hell is Oh, War of the Worlds. Mm. I remember that was the critics were so split on that when it came out. I rewatched it. It's amazing. We need another. Uh, when is when is old Stevie going to give us another one? <laughs> he just gave us two great ones back to back. What are you working yeah, on? There, Stevie? A little break. Uh, All right. Well, we uh, we obviously took some questions, but we ran so long that we're actually just going to probably answer them on a second oh, podcast. Yeah. We're gonna we did go long. We're gonna double it up. We got a lot of good questions, so we'll title that "Best Movies of 2023 Part 2. And uh, yeah, that does it for our best movies of the year, 2023. We're on to 2024. I think it was a a good year in cinema. Hopefully movies don't die off this year. Hopefully they continue to to move in in a direction. Got Dune at least. Oh, right. Dune. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll, hopefully we'll be back here next year and maybe Teddy will see more than three. No, yeah, it is like great year, especially like when you think about all the projects, like you got a Fincher, Nolan, Scorsese, Greta Gerwig. And you're like, all right, well, what, what do we got? What do we got next year? I don't think any of them are going back to back. No, no, they're not. No, we got a villain new. Yeah, I'm sure, uh, you know, some, some movies will sneak up on us. Yeah, they always do. And uh, we'll be on the lookout. Thank you guys for listening, for watching, for liking, for subscribing, for subbing. Um, uh, and like I said, be on the lookout for our part two uh, best movies of 2023, where we will be answering some of your questions. We got a lot of good ones, so there will be a lot of good things to talk about. And uh, yeah, Aaron, any any last words? Any New Year's resolutions? Oh, God, no. Just set yourself up for failure. It's not a good way to start the year. That's actually, yeah, that's a f- f- smart way of looking at it. Yeah. You can't fail if you don't have a goal. That's could have put it any better myself. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen this meme. It's uh, Xi Jinping, and he's just Chad. He's just like got a huge jaw, and he's jacked. And uh, the meme, the caption is, do nothing. And then the next sentence is, win. 
<laughs> and somebody <laughs> said that's been Chinese foreign policy <laughs> during the 21st century. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Wow, that was probably our best review yet. Hey guys, Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey here with a brief shameless plug before we end the video. Do you ever feel like you don't have an adequate amount of nerd soup in your life? Like you're going to bed hungry and yearning for the nonsensical yet entertaining nutrients our podcasts provide? Well, we've come up with the perfect solution. The Nerd Soup Fan Question Podcast, exclusively available to our Patreon supporters. You can sign up now by visiting patreon.com slash nerdsoup, and for the price of only $1 per month, you'll receive exclusive access to our weekly podcast, where we answer your questions that don't make it to the main show. And while you're there, you can check out the other rewards we offer to our patrons, like stick Stickers, mugs, t-shirts, behind-the-scenes footage, and appearing in the credits at the end of our videos. And that's exactly what we're gonna do right now. Roll the names of the nerds who make Nerd Soup possible. The reason why the crypto crash didn't send our lives spiraling down a black hole of no return. Alright, I'll stop talking so you can listen to this jazzy-ass music while checking if Bo spelt your name wrong in the credits.